Have you ever read something so twisted and disturbing that it made you want to rip your hair out and glue it into your gouged out eye sockets? No? Boring. Well, luckily, you have me, who can recommend you some books that will fill those empty holes in your head with some seriously twisted literature. Hmm, let's see. You know what? We'll kick off today with a doozy, Heinrich Himmler's personal grimoire. If you're unfamiliar with the name, Double H was one of the leading members of the Yahtzee party, so my verbiage might get interesting for the next little bit. Double H founded the Annenerb, which was a pseudo-scientific organization that was active between 1935 to 1945 and devoted to the task of promoting the racial beliefs held by the Yahtzees. Himmler was very much drawn to the occult and tied this interest into his racist philosophy, like proof of Aryan and Nordic racial superiority from ancient times. He promoted a cult of ancestor worship, particularly among members of the SS, as a way to keep the race pure and provide immortality to the nation. Viewing the SS as an order along the lines of the Teutonic Knights, he had them take over the church of said order in Vienna in 1939. He began the process of replacing Christianity with a new moral code that rejected humanitarianism and challenged the Christian concept of marriage. Himmler modified a variety of existing customs to emphasize the elitism and central role of the SS. An SS naming ceremony was to replace baptism, marriage ceremonies were to be altered, a separate SS funeral ceremony was to be held in addition to Christian ceremonies, and SS-centric celebrations of the summer and winter solstices were instituted. Historian Nicholas Godric Clark analyzed all of this in his 1985 book, The Occult Roots of Yahtzeeism, in which he argued that there were in fact links between some ideals of Ariosophy and Yahtzee ideology. He also analyzed the problems of the numerous popular occult historiography books written on the topic. In Goodrick Clark's review, the Ariosophist movement built on the early ideas of the Volkisch movement, a traditionalist pan German response to industrialization and urbanization, but associated the problems of modernism, specifically with the supposed misdeeds of Freemasonry, Kabbalah, and Let's see if I can get this one right, folks. Rosy Crucianism, in order to prove the modern world was based on false and evil principles. The Riosophist ideals and symbols filtered through several anti Semitic and nationalist groups in late Wilhelmian Germany, from which the early Yahtzee party emerged in Munich after the First World War. He demonstrated quite a few links between two Ariosophists and Heinrich Himmler. An article titled Schmittler's Forgotten Library by Timothy Ryback, published in The Atlantic, mentions a book from the Dictator's Private Library authored by Ernst Schertl. Now, Ernst, whose interests were flagellation, dance, occultism, nudism, and quinky things, had also been active as an activist for sexual liberation before 1933. Now, supposedly there is some remnant of Yahtzee magic that can be cleaned from a study of ice magic and through the work of Blavatsky. Nevertheless, I wouldn't recommend bringing that strain of magic back into the world. Never mind finding Himmler's secret grimoire. No thanks. Next up is less a singular spellbook, but more so any grimoire or spellbook that promises an expertise in B L O O D magic. Sorry, folks, the interwebs are not a fan of the B word, so I have to find substitutes for the redness that pours out of a human wound. When it comes to practitioners of said magic, it's similar, if not exactly the same, as to how the Aztecs wielded power. This might sound kind of cliche, but power like that always comes with a price, which is the reason the Aztecs killed so many people. They avoided the cost by using prisoners, or folks they deemed the lowest of the low. With so much death at ritualistic points where the veil is thin, they could commune or even summon dark entities to the physical realm. So while the idea of forbidden knowledge may seem fun or rebellious or even glamorous, there's things you just shouldn't mess with in the first place. If you're looking for a specific title to avoid, one that I've talked about plenty on here that touches on the subject is the Grimorium Verum. Translated as the Grimoire of Truth, this text has a reputation that yeah, goes without saying. It originated in the 18th century and is part of European magical tradition. And uh, it's not for the faint of heart. The Grimorium Verum is essentially a guidebook, but not the kind you'd find on your local bookstore's bestseller shelf. Nah, this is more like a how-to manual for dealing with entities not exactly on the Christmas card list. The inclusion of red fluids in its rituals is one of its most chilling aspects, if you ask me. I don't really like seeing redness anywhere. It's not the kind of magic you see in fairy tales. This is the stuff of dark alleys and ancient rites. The text details ceremonies involving the shedding of said fluids to summon and control otherworldly beings. It's a kind of forbidden knowledge that's been whispered about in hushed tones throughout history. Like it's just like you hear about it, you don't talk about it. Also, it doesn't stop at fluid exchanges. Like it's an overall comprehensive guide to dealing with demons. Like if you want to make a pact with a demon, yeah, this is the place for it. It's got the instructions for creating a pact, specific prayers and invocations. Technically, it's like a step-by-step -step guide for anybody seeking supernatural assistance. Whether that's a good idea or not, that's up for debate. So why was this banned? And why should you not be reading it? 
Well, let's just say the church, who we all love, wasn't exactly thrilled about people trying to summon demons on a random Tuesday afternoon. The church authorities saw these texts as a threat, not just to the spiritual well-being of their practitioners, but also to the established order. If there's one thing we know about the church, they don't like being threatened. After all, summoning demons and dabbling in fluid magic doesn't exactly align with a Sunday sermon. Not that I personally agree with the church on most things, but this might be the one time I do. You don't want a demon at Thanksgiving. Okie dokie folks, are you ready for some more fun cult stuff? Ok, so you've all heard about Scientology, right? The cult that pretty much owns Tom Cruise and a bunch of other celebrities? Well, it turns out that their original founder wrote a book that he alleged caused people to take their own lives. And if that isn't magically inclined in some way, I don't know what is. It prompts reflection on the power dynamics between the written word, belief systems, and the vulnerability of the human psyche. So what is it about this text that can drive individuals to the brink? Well, apparently it's the allure of the unknown, the manipulation of belief systems, maybe a combination of factors that pushes people beyond the boundaries of reason. So we've talked about this guy before, L. Ron Hubbard. He was discussing the Atlantis civilization, and he claimed to have gained this knowledge through his own research and experiences. Am I going to pretend like I know how he experienced those things? Nope. But here's the thing. This piece of writing has been almost entirely erased from the internet. If you're more tech savvy than I am, feel free to add links in the comments section, but outside of venturing into the dark web, I couldn't find a copy of this specific work anywhere or a listing on any official record of all of this. The erasure of almost all mentions of this book from the vast expanse of the internet only adds to the mystery in my mind. In this crazy digital age where I can google whatever I want, the ability to expunge a work from the digital realm raises quite a few questions about the extent of control over the narrative. Not to sound like my university profs. It's as if the book itself has become this elusive specter, lingering in the shadows of cyberspace. Now, I'm not completely oblivious to the control that present day Scientology has in our society, but it's really scary to see it in practice. Like, their attempt to erase any traces of this work raises so many ethical questions about the control of information. In this digital age, where information is considered a cornerstone of freedom, the deliberate suppression of a narrative kind of is like, what the heck? Like, what other forbidden books are there? Just like waiting in the shadows that I don't even know about waiting to disturb some minds out there. Well, there's the Shams al-Marif, or Shams al-Marif wa lata if al-Abarif, which is a 13th century grimoire centered on Arabic magic and has claimed to be a manual for achieving esoteric spirituality. I apologize from the bottom of my heart if I butchered that pronunciation anyway, I promise I did practice. It was written by the scholar Ahmed al-Buni, who wrote it while living in Algeria. He passed around 1225 Common Era. It was written by the scholar Ahmed Albuni, who wrote it while living in Algeria and he passed around 1225 Common Era. Now, the book is a patchwork of bits and pieces of the author's authentic works and texts by other authors. Scholars like Ibn Tamiya have criticized the book and labeled Albuni as a deluded double worshipper. Eh, good to know that across all religions, over time, some things never changed. Now, in terms of more modern examples, that was a common assumption from Ed and Lorraine Warren. You know, the demonologist that I quote all the time. Look, I believe half of what they investigated was real, the other half was them making a living, which at the end of the day, I have to give some respect to. Well, minus viewing alternative lifestyles outside of Christianity as a sin. Ok, pardon me, sorry, I get a little sidetracked. In contemporary form, the book consists of two volumes, the Shams al-Marif al-Kubra and the Shams al-Marif al-Sukra, with the former being the larger of the two. The first few chapters introduce the reader to magic squares, and the combination of numbers and the alphabet that are believed to bring magical effect, which the author claims is the only way to communicate with jinn, angels, and spirits. The table of contents that were introduced in the later printed editions of the work contain a list of unnumbered chapters, which stretched to a number of 40 by the way. However, prior to the printing press and various other standardizations, there were three independent volumes that circulated, each one differing in length. While being popular, it also carries a notorious reputation for being suppressed and banned from much of Islamic history, ergo how it found its way to our list today. Don't read it. However, it continues to persist in being read and studied up to present day, despite its questionable veracity and negative implications. Some Sufi orders, such as the Naqshbandi Haqqani order, have recognized its legitimacy and use as a compendium for the occult and hold it in high respect. Now, another title by the same author, the title having been translated to the Source of the Essentials of Wisdom, is considered its companion text. In terms of translation, although the overall formal translation to English hasn't really happened yet, there have been numerous renditions of a few of the more popular rituals found within the main treaties, as well as those that lie in its accompanying text. So. Don't bother, don't go near it. Ok folks, I think I'm going to end today with the Munich Manual of Demonic Magic. The MMDM or Liber Incantionium Exorcium et Fascinatorium Vervarium. <laughs> Let me try that again. The MMDM or, well, let's see if I can get this folks, Liber Incantationum Exorcimorum et Fascinatinium 
Variarum is a 15th century grimoire manuscript. The text composed in Latin is largely concerned with demonology and necromancy. Richard Kikefer edited the text of the manuscript in 1998 under the title Forbidden Rites, a necromancer's manual of the 15th century. Portions of the text in English translation are presented in Forbidden Rites as well, embedded within the author's essays and explanations on the Munich manual in specific and grimoires in general. The Russian translation of this Latin grimoire was published in 2019, while well, the first English translation only came out last year. Now, there is only one known surviving manuscript of the original Munich Manual, which is almost complete, except for the first two folios that describe the beginning of the first ritual. The rest of the grimoire contains complete instructions for the invocation of demons such as, hmm, let's see, Satan, Lilith. Asaroth and Samel, as well as the supposed attainment of favors and supernatural powers from them. Some of the spells allow for obtaining the love of a woman, achieving invisibility, acquiring wealth and treasures, or gaining knowledge. The text is accompanied by over 40 illustrations of magic circles and symbols to be used in said rituals. So, for example, page 130 to 133 of the text includes a list of 11 demons, similar to the Ars Goetia. And since there's only 11, I guess I could list them off. So we've got Count Slash Duke Barbarus. Duke Casson, President slash Count Otius, King Curson, Duke Alugor, Prince Tub, President Volak, Duke Generon, Marquis Tuveries, President Hani, and Marquis Sukax. I promise I did my best. Most of the text is in Latin, which is not a language I speak, with the exception of two appended materials in German and Italian. So let's see, we got messing with demons and manipulation of others to your will? Yeah, no thanks, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. Number five, The Yellow Wallpaper. Okay, The Yellow Wallpaper. I first read this book when I was in fifth grade, and I do know that it is a lot of required reading for a lot of people. Like, you'd read it in ninth or tenth grade. So you may be thinking now, oh my god, V, why would you put this on the list? It's not cursed, we can all read it. It's a weird book. And it's a good book, a really flipping good book. And I know that we have a lot of videos on this channel of books that are cursed that you cannot read and that you will never get the chance to read. So I wanted to create a video about books that are going to mess up your head and twist your psychology into a complete knot. But if a complete mind twist doesn't interest you and you would prefer hearing about the more supernatural aspects of Top 5 Scary, just search books on our channel search bar and you will get a plethora of videos to choose from. Today I really want to talk about things that we can all relate to, but if you are interested in some reading that will mess your mind up and leave you scared and thinking for the rest of your life, definitely stick around because we are about to get into some really cool and twisted reading. So no Number four, or number five and four now because I rambled too much. Let's try this again. The Yellow Wallpaper. This book is a masterclass in imagery and descriptive devices because wow, you feel like you are in this room. It follows a woman who is placed into a room that is lined wall to wall with yellow wallpaper. And slowly, page by page, she begins to go insane, describing more outlandish and detailed scenes being played out in the lines of her wallpaper. Throughout the story, her descriptions get so much more in depth depth and twisted and you begin to feel like you are going insane with her. Every single word, every single thing that she is imagining, you are seeing full on face to face. It's like you're looking it in the eyes. And I have aphantasia so I actually cannot visualize anything in my head. Like you say think of an apple and I don't see an apple, it's just darkness. But somehow this book was able to surpass my biological evolution and I was able to imagine everything. Every word, every description, it was being burnt into my eyelids. And there are very few books that can do that for me, which is how you know that this is an insanely weird and well written story. I really recommend giving this a read. It will mess with your mind and you will never ever want to have yellow wallpaper again. Which, okay, interestingly enough, this book actually made me want to have yellow wallpaper when I was in the fifth grade. So I don't know, maybe this job is like where I was destined to work because I don't think many people after reading this book would yearn so desperately to have yellow wallpaper. Number three, I have no mouth and I must scream. I don't even know where to start with this one. This book left me with such a disturbed and upset feeling right into the pit of my stomach. The story follows a group of five people, the last people alive in a post-apocalyptic earth that are being eternally tormented in a computer called Am. Okay, so the first time I read this, I was pretty confused up until I would say probably the second page and then I started getting really, really into it. But I think you're supposed to be confused so you can really settle into the story and the world. 
world and all of the ideas within. The book centers around five characters who are essentially stuck in an advanced AI computer called Am in a post-apocalyptic world. The computer is vengeful and torments them eternally. They have been stuck here, unaging, essentially immortalized for 109 years. Allegedly. It's okay, it's kind of hard to know for sure because the computer like messes with their mind and time a lot. Every single day for these humans is filled with the computer, psychologically, physically tormenting them in every way imaginable, in insanely disturbing and creative ways. The book ends with the character who we are hearing the story from, realizing that the only way to end the torment they are experiencing and to hurt the computer in some way as like revenge is through their death or by taking away Am's toys. Somehow he ends up being the last one alive. I won't spoil it exactly, but everyone else is dead except for him. Am is very, very upset by this. So Am ensures that for the rest of eternity, he, the last alive, will suffer every day and will never be given the chance to escape through death like the others. He is essentially turned, he is essentially turned into a living blob, lacking limbs and appendages, just, wait, lacking limbs and appendages, lacking ears and eyes and a mouth. He's just a mass of goo. His eye sockets are described as being filled with a white fog. He is stuck unmoving for the rest of his eternal life. Which of course brings us to the final line of the book and the title, I have no mouth and I must scream. So yeah, this is an incredibly disturbing book. Cursed, I guess you could say. I would definitely recommend giving the story a read. It is short, but the impact it will have on you is nothing less than long lasting and permanent. Number two, The Lottery. I first read this book a couple of months ago in July. It was an English camp retreat that I read it at, which I won't get too much into, but let's just say I did not enjoy that too much. I was one of two girls in a group of 18 guys and they were all years younger than me and most of them weren't funny and mansplained everything to me, which is my worst nightmare. And it was painful, but actually from the teachers, it was a very educational experience and I learned a lot. And one of the things I learned about was this story, The Lottery. It is a short story, written by the famous Shirley Jackson, and it definitely makes you think. Upon first read, it definitely gives off Hunger Games vibes, and I'm sorry I said vibes, but there is no other way to explain it. Same vibes. It is a very surprising read. I think you'll be surprised by the ending, but upon rereading it, you kind of realize how brutally obvious every piece of foreshadowing was. But upon the first read, you're left with an uneasy feeling. You do not expect what's to come. Especially up until the third page, you really don't realize how uneasy everyone is in the story. Story. You hear about a tradition that other towns are considering canceling. You hear about these very young people going around in groups of friends and picking up pebbles that are being collected in piles after being released from school. You hear casual conversation being exchanged through neighbors. You don't hear the underlying unease that is being sown throughout the crowd of people. Someone goes up to the front of the crowd and next to a dinky yet looming box, they begin to explain that they will be drawing names, like every year in this town's annual lottery. The reader thinks, oh, a game, a lottery, a winner. This is exciting, this is cool, this is great. But you do not expect the ending. And for me, it was kind of a whoa moment where I had to take a step back and reevaluate where the book had shifted to. It's a great book filled with eerie imagery and explanations and another that will absolutely stay burned into your mind. Number one, The Landlady. This book is by one of my all-time favorite authors, Roald Dahl. Responsible for creating some of the most famous stories of all time like Matilda, The Witches, James and the Giant Peach, The BFG, Lamb to the Slaughter, and so 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 many more, it's no surprising that he would be capable of creating a truly disturbing short story very worthy of being on this list. So the landlady follows a boy named Billy who is starting a new job in a new town. He looks for a place to stay the night when all of a sudden he sees a beautifully charming and warm house advertising itself as a bed and breakfast. It is run by a friendly but odd lady and and only two guests had previously stayed there in the past three years. We know there have only been two guests thanks to a guest book that the old woman makes every single guest who stays there sign, which she tells Billy, and when Billy is signing it, he recognizes the two names, which are the only ones on it, but he can't remember where he recognizes them from, though he feels like they were both famous for the same thing, like they were in a newspaper or something for the same thing. I won't spoil anything because uncovering the truth yourself is far more exciting, 
frustrating. Throughout the book you feel an uneasy sense of dread, discomfort and frustration as the naive main character innocently believes everything he is being told and does not seem to comprehend the idea that he could be in danger. It is an extremely captivating book and I find the descriptions to be very, very lively. The dialogue is eerie and sets the tone of the story masterfully. This book leaves you with a sinking feeling like no other. If you are looking for a read that will stay in your mind every time you check into a small B&B, which you know, I don't, it's not very common anymore, this is definitely the book for you. Number 5. The Great Omar. The Great Omar was a one of a kind, tailor made collection of Omar Khayyam's poetry. So if you're looking to score this at your local Barnes and Noble, you might have a bit of trouble. It was commissioned by the owner of a British bookshop, whose sole request was that it would be the greatest modern binding in the world. You know, nothing too lofty though. The book itself is made of 5,000 pieces of leather, 1,000 different gemstones, 100 square feet of gold, and some pages too, I guess. I think there's poetry inside there. The final book was priced for roughly $150,000 after finishing. So it's a pretty expensive book. But what makes it so cursed? Well, when the Great Omar was purchased, it was bought by an American buyer and had to take a transatlantic trip on a little ship called the Titanic, a boat which as far as I know has never been involved in any sort of historical events of note whatsoever. The Great Omar was never recovered from the wreckage and sank with the ship. Ten weeks after the book kissed the ocean floor, the man who bound it, Francis Sangorski, drowned while on vacation. At the, only the age of 37. A little suspicious, isn't it? A bookbinder in the 1930s tried to recreate the great Omar, Stanley Bray. He finished the second iteration just in time for World War II to begin. The book was placed in a vault on London's 4th Street, which was one of the first sites to be bombed. I guess they heard about the book. The safe that held the book endured through the Blitz, but the safe's contents and the second Great Omar was incinerated and lost to the war. A third version has been crafted and is currently being held in a vault in the British Library, although given the book's history, I don't feel like I would be too comfortable spending any time around it if I didn't have to. Hey, liking what we do here at Top 5 Scary? Will we always love a little subscribe? Toss one our way. Number four, The Grand Grimoire. Another book you're probably gonna have some trouble finding on Amazon. The Grand Grimoire is a tome of black magic. No one can agree on when the Grimoire was originally birthed into this world, with people claiming that it could have been written anywhere from the 15th century to the 19th century. No one knows who even wrote the Grand Grimoire. Perhaps it merely appeared one day from another world tantalizing and asking to be read. Some urban legends claim that the book was written by a man possessed by the devil himself, acting as a vessel for his will to pen his musings. The book itself contains instructions for well, the, the, the book itself contains instructions for would-be warlocks to summon all manner of demons and sinister servants of the underworld, even including guides on how a fledgling necromancer could learn how to raise a spirit from the dead. Now, if all that sounds appealing to you, it's said that even so much as cracking the spine of the Grand Grimoire is enough to seal your soul to damnation, the literary equivalent of promising your soul to the underworld. The church, obviously, sought out to quell the rising threat of the Grand Grimoire's dark musings, and it is said that the original Grand Grimoire, gosh that is fun to say, is currently being held sealed in the Vatican's legendary vault, where it shall never again be seen by prying eyes, or those wishing to uncover its many many dark secrets. There are alleged excerpts that have been reprinted and made available, but the full grand grimoire itself hasn't been seen by anyone in what would be centuries. Perhaps for good reason too, I mean if the myths and legends around the book are to be believed. Number 3. The Book of Abramelin The Book of Abramelin, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm sure one of you ghouls and goblins will let me know, or the Book of the Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage, if you're not into that whole brevity thing, is an allegedly magic text that is thought to have been written at some some point during the 14th century. It wasn't until the 19th century that it became recognized for its power, when the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn translated the book into English in the late 1890s. Now, If you're unfamiliar with the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and you're wondering which Final Fantasy that's from, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was a secret society devoted to the study of the occult and spiritual development. From here, the book became a key text in occultism, supposedly even inspiring Aleister Crowley system of magic. So what's inside the book? Any pop-ups? The book centers around an incredibly elaborate ritual aimed at allowing a practicing sorcerer to communicate with their holy guardian angel. The book theorizing that everyone has their own personal guardian angel, a celestial other half from another world, if you will. After the sorcerer summons their guardian angel and enjoys a honeymoon phase, the book describes a uh, period of 
blissful intimacy, one needs to conquer every unredeemed spirit of the infernal regions. Which sounds like a bit of a task. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of unredeemed spirit. Luckily, I, I think the angel helps out a bit. If the legends are true, then undoubtedly the information in this book isn't the kind of thing that should ever be falling into the wrong hands. I mean, that's just a general good piece of life advice. As a general rule of thumb, you shouldn't mess with demons unless you know what you're doing, okay? That's the kind of thing to leave up to professionals. For all of our sakes, you know? Number 2. The Voynich Manuscript The Voynich Manuscript is one of the more interesting books on this list. It's named after the first public owner of it, Wilfred Voynich. Unlike most of these cursed banned books, the Voynich Manuscript is actually something you can seek out and read via Yale University's online collection. And you are more than welcome to peer over its pages, although you might find it a bit of a difficult text to read. Because the Voynich Manuscript is written in a language that no human being speaks or has ever spoken. Carbon dating suggests the manuscript was first written at some unspecified time during the 14th century. And all 240 of the manuscript's pages are written completely unintelligibly. So if you want to take a look at this thing and try and help us crack this, please be my guest. Adorning its pages are confusing illustrations that only serve to further its mysterious reputation. With most of the drawings looking like a cross between a Hieronymus Bosch painting and a fever dream kaleidoscope nightmare. The book has made its way through countless owners, a succession of kings and other powerful leaders. And yet in all the years of its existence, no one has even come remotely close to understanding just what the Voynich manuscript is, where it came from, and what its purpose is. Is it cursed? Well, it's possible. Maybe it contains the instructions for all manner of demonic and occult magic and we just don't know how to read it yet. There are some people who believe that the Voynich manuscript could have been written by an extraterrestrial entity and gifted to us. And there's even some legends that claim the manuscript has some sort of apocalyptic curse hidden inside its mysterious scrawlings. We might never know, unless you might be the one to crack it for us. Number 1. Codex Gigas Codex Gigas? 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 One of you guys will tell me, I'm sure. Oft referred to as the Devil's Bible is the biggest entry on this list. And not just for its renown. No, it, it's like literally the biggest entry on this list. It's three feet tall and weighs around 80 pounds. It wouldn't surprise me at all if the curse this book inflicts on you is a hernia. The Codex Gigas, which literally translates to giant book, is a medieval manuscript dating back to the 12th century. So what's the deal with the Codex Gigas? Well, legends tell the Codex was penned by a monk who had broken his vows, and to repent for his sins, he was sentenced to be walled up alive. He promised, as an apology, that he would write a powerful book to glorify the monastery, and his book would contain all known human knowledge at that point. Everything. The original Wikipedia, and he wasn't even asking for donations. The legend continues that the monk, realizing that this task was a bit lofty, even for the quickest of scribes, reached out for some help co-authoring his mighty manuscript. He reached out and prayed, but not from God, but instead from Lucifer, asking for help finishing the book in exchange for his eternal soul. I'm uh, starting to understand why he was sentenced for breaking his vows. Not really the best plan if you're looking to redeem yourself in the eyes of the church by making a deal with the devil, but hey. We've all done pretty crazy things trying to make a deadline, I totally get it. It's said that Lucifer himself helped complete the book, and the monk drew a portrait of the devil himself as thanks. That's where the book gets its name, The Devil's Bible. The book is replete with occultism, dark rituals, and imagery. I mean, after all, it's said to contain the entirety of the knowledge of the human race up to this point. So who's to speak what sort of sinister secrets are kept between its giant pages? There were estimates and tests to try and recreate the manuscript, suggesting that even one man writing, without illustrations, would have taken the better part of two decades to write the calligraphy present inside that book. So did this monk have some otherworldly help? Maybe just a huge stack of Red Bull? And what is inside this book? If your Latin's any good, the manuscript is kept on display in the National Library of Stockholm. Just be careful what you read. You got no idea what you could bring into this world. The Oracles of Nostradamus, penned by Michel de Nostradam. This collection of prophecies has been linked with numerous calamities, including natural disasters and wars. Some believe that merely reading it can bring about bad luck or even 
losing your life. The prophecies of Nostradamus have been a topic of fascination and debate since their first publication in the late 16th century. Despite being written centuries ago, many people still turn to these prophetic writings for insight into the future. But who was Nostradamus and how accurate were his predictions? Michel de Nostradamus, or Nostradamus, as he is more commonly known, was a French physician and astrologer who lived during the Renaissance period. He gained popularity for his medical writings and later turned to writing almanacs that contained his predictions for the future. Nostradamus' prophecies were written in a cryptic format using a mix of historical references, astrological symbolism, and wordplay. The style of writing has led to different interpretations of his predictions, with some claiming that they have accurately foretold major events such as the rise of Hitler. However, many critics argue that these prophecies are vague and open to various interpretations, making it easy for people to find connections with past events. They also point out that Nostradamus' predictions were often written after the said event had already occurred, leading to accusations of them being nothing more than cleverly crafted hindsight. Despite the criticisms, the fascination with Nostradamus and his prophecies continues to this day. People still turn to his writings for insight into current events and potential future disasters. Some even believe that his predictions predictions are divinely inspired and hold the key to unlocking the mysteries of the universe. Regardless of one's beliefs, it cannot be denied that Nostradamus was a highly enigmatic figure whose prophecies have stood the test of time. Whether they were truly accurate or simply coincidental remains a mystery that will continue to intrigue and captivate us for years to come. So the next time you come across a mention of Nostradamus and his prophecies, take a moment to ponder on the enigma that surrounds this infamous figure. Who knows, maybe one day we will finally uncover the truth behind his cryptic writings and unravel the mystery of the future. Next up, we have the ominously named Book of the Dead, an ancient Egyptian funerary text. It's fascinating, but let's just say you wouldn't want it on your bedside table. The Book of the Dead is a collection of ancient Egyptian funerary texts that were used to guide and protect the deceased in the afterlife. These papyri were typically buried with the dead and contained a variety of spells, incantations, and instructions for navigating through the afterlife. In ancient Egypt, it was believed that passing was not an end, but rather a transition to the afterlife. The Book of the Dead was an essential part of this journey as it provided guidance and protection for the deceased. The spells and incantations in this book were believed to have magical powers that could help the deceased overcome obstacles and challenges in the afterlife. They also contained instructions on how to properly perform rituals and ceremonies that would ensure the deceased's successful transition to the afterlife. This book was not a single text, but rather a collection of spells and texts customized for each individual the spells are often tailored to fit the specific needs and beliefs of the deceased and their family. Interestingly, these papyri were not only reserved for the elite or wealthy. Even commoners could afford to have their own Book of the Dead, albeit with fewer spells and illustrations. The Book of the Dead also played a significant role in shaping ancient Egyptian beliefs and practices surrounding passing and the afterlife. It provided a sense of comfort and reassurance that their loved ones would be taken care of in the afterlife. In addition to its religious and spiritual significance, this book also served as a valuable source of historical information. It provided insights into ancient Egyptian beliefs, rituals, and customs, and has greatly aided in understanding this fascinating civilization. Today, many original copies of this text are housed in museums around the world, while others have been lost to time or destroyed. However, its impact on ancient Egyptian culture and its enduring legacy still fascinates scholars and individuals alike. It serves as a testament to the power of beliefs and rituals in shaping our understanding of life, passing, and afterlife. The Book of the Dead continues to capture our imagination and remains an integral part of ancient Egyptian culture. Its enigmatic spells and vivid illustrations continue to intrigue us, offering a glimpse into the beliefs and practices of one of the world's oldest civilizations. So while you may not want it on your bedside table, the Book of the Dead remains a captivating and essential piece of ancient Egyptian history. The fascination with passing and the afterlife is a common theme among many cultures throughout history. Next on our list is the Picatrix, an ancient Egyptian Greek more filled with magical and astrological secrets. Supposedly, it can inflict madness on those who dare to decipher it. The Picatrix is a mysterious and intriguing grimoire that has fascinated scholars and occultists for centuries. The Picatrix is a mysterious and intriguing grimoire that has fascinated scholars and occultists for centuries. Its origins can be traced back to ancient Arabic texts believed to have been written in the 10th or 11th century. The name Picatrix is derived from the Latin word Picus, 
meaning tar and tricks, which translates to maker or creator. This name perfectly encapsulates the book's contents as it is said to have the power to create and manifest magical effects. The Picatrix is divided into four books, each containing various chapters and sections. The first book primarily focuses on cosmology and astrology, exploring the relationship between celestial bodies and magic. It delves into the planetary influences and their corresponding herbs, stones, and metals that can be used in magical rituals. The second book delves deeper into the practical application of magic, providing instructions on creating talismans and amulets for specific purposes. It also discusses the use of planetary hours and astrological calculations to enhance the effectiveness of spells. The third book is dedicated to exploring natural magic, which involves harnessing the powers of nature and its elements for magical purposes. The section covers topics such as alchemy, dream interpretation, and the creation of various magical objects. And the final book delves into advanced forms of magic, including evocation and invocation of spirits, demons, and other entities. It also provides instructions on how to summon and control these beings for personal gain. Despite its reputation as a dangerous and powerful grimoire, the Picatrix is also revered for its rich knowledge and insights into ancient magical practices. It has been studied and referenced by many occultists throughout history, including famous figures such as Cornelius Agrippa and John Dee. The Picatrix continues to intrigue and captivate modern readers, sparking debates about its true intentions and power. Whether it is a powerful tool for manifesting magic or simply an elaborate collection of ancient knowledge, the Picatrix remains a significant piece of occult literature that continues to inspire and fascinate today. So if you dare to delve into its secrets, be warned. You may encounter madness or enlightenment along the way, so why not take a chance and unravel the mysteries of the Picatrix for yourself. Who knows what hidden knowledge and power it may hold. Coming up next is the Voynich manuscript. Its unknown language and peculiar diagrams have baffled scholars for ages and is said to bring misfortune to those who attempt to decode it. The Voynich manuscript is one of the most mysterious and enigmatic books in history. It has been the subject of countless studies, theories, and speculations, yet its true meaning remains elusive. Believed to have originated from Central Europe in the early 15th century, the manuscript was named after Wilfred Voynich, a Polish book dealer who acquired it in 1912. Many have attempted to decipher the manuscript's unknown language, but all have failed. The text is written in a unique script that has not been seen in any other known language, adding to the mystery and intrigue surrounding it. Some scholars believe that the text may be a code or cipher, while others argue that it is an entirely new language created by the author. The illustrations and diagrams in the Voynich manuscript are equally perplexing. They depict unknown plants, astrological symbols, and even images of naked women bathing in mysterious pools. Some theories suggest that the manuscript may hold secrets related to alchemy or herbal medicine, while others believe it could be a religious or philosophical text. Despite numerous attempts to decipher its contents, this manuscript has managed to keep its secrets hidden. Many have devoted their entire careers to studying it, with some even claiming to have made breakthroughs in understanding its language and illustrations, however these claims have yet to be proven, and the mystery of the manuscript continues. One of the most intriguing aspects of the Voynich manuscript is its rumored curse. According to legend, anyone who attempts to decipher it will be met with misfortune and even losing your life. While this may seem far-fetched, it is a fact that many of the manuscript's previous owners have faced tragic endings. Despite its mysterious nature and rumored curse, the Voynich manuscript remains an object of fascination for scholars and enthusiasts. Its unique language and cryptic illustrations can continue to ignite curiosity and inspire new theories and attempts to unravel its secrets. Will the mystery of the Voynich manuscript ever be solved? Only time will tell. In the meantime, it remains a testament to the enduring power of human curiosity and our quest for knowledge. Who knows what secrets may lie within its pages waiting to be discovered. And finally, we have the Grand Grimoire, also known as the Red Dragon. This text is believed to contain powerful demonic rituals and is kept locked away in the Vatican's secret archives. The Grand Grimoire is a mysterious and ancient text that has captured the imagination of many for centuries. It is said to contain powerful demonic rituals and spells, making it a highly sought after book by those interested in the occult. According to the legend, the Grand Grimoire was written by King Solomon himself, who was known for his wisdom and mastery over demons. It's said that he wrote the book with the help of a demon named Asmodeus, who was bound to his will by a magical ring. However, there are conflicting theories on the origins of the Grand Grimoire. Some believe that it was actually written in the 16th century by a man named Honorius of Thebes, while others believe that it was a compilation of various texts from different authors. Despite its disputed origins, the Grand Grimoire has gained a reputation as one of the most powerful and dangerous books in 
existence. It's even rumored to have been used by Napoleon Bonaparte himself to gain power and success on the battlefield. Due to its perceived danger and influence, the Grand Grimoire has been closely guarded and kept locked away in the Vatican secret archives. It's said that only a select few have access to it, and even then, they must go through rigorous testing and training before being allowed to study its contents. The secrecy surrounding the Grand Grimoire has only added to its allure, with many believing that it holds the key to unlocking great power and knowledge. However, some caution that the rituals and spells within its page should not be taken lightly, as they could have serious consequences for those who attempt to use them. Number 5. The Book of the Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage The Book of Abramelin, or more formally, the Book of the Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage, is a Jewish magic text that is thought to date back at some point in the 14th or 15th century. Now, it wasn't this initial publication that gave it such a notoriety. There wasn't really a lot of book reviewing going on back then. It was when it was upheld by the 19th and 20th century magicians who made up the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which kind of sounds like a fake bad guy from an RPG, but is a British secret society dedicated to the practice, research, and upholding of old occult magic ways. Can't be that secret though, because I'm talking about it. One of the founders of the Golden Dawn, one SLM Matters, created the first ever English translation of the book in the 1890s, drawing from a 17th century French translation. Mathers' translation became the definite magic text of the 19th century, eventually helping inspire Aleister Crowley, the legendary occultist and fixture of one of the best Ozzy Osbourne songs ever. There's all kinds of spells and magic inside the text. Some highlights include spells on how to conjure someone into a donkey, summon a monkey to do your bidding, how to bring forth spirits to fetch you goods. The key point in the text, however, is an epic multi-month ritual that if performed correctly will allow the sorcerer to commune with their guardian angel other half. The book posits that everyone's guardian angel is another part of their essence, a spiritual other. The ritual involves, oh, um, I don't really know how to say this politely. You have to get um, um, blissfully intimate with the angel, and, and once this honeymoon period is over, the caster then has to summon up and conquer unredeemed spirits of the infernal regions of hell to conquer them, and then will be able to be master of the spirit domain. That all sounds pretty complicated though, honestly, so all things considered, maybe it's for the best that this one's locked away. I don't really need to mess with magic, that's above my pay grade, and I'm not looking to get too intimate with my significant other guardian angel anytime soon. But if you're looking for more true tales of terror, fake frightening fibs, cursed relics, ancient evils, ancient crypt aliens, conspiracies, ghouls, goblins, and way more of this guy, Top 5 Scary is the only place to be. So stay subscribed, make sure you hit that little bell so you don't miss a scream, but, and I know this is a big ask, do that at the end of this video, because I got four more cursed books coming for you right now. Number 4, The Codex Gigas. When it comes to cursed and demonic books, The Codex Gigas is one of the biggest ones around. Like, literally. Codex Gigas translates to Giant Book, which isn't a very scary name. But when you see the size of this behemoth, it starts to make a bit more sense. The thing is massive, two feet long. While giant oversized illuminated manuscripts were fairly common around this era, this one stood out for its immense size and also the impressively scary rumors surrounding the cursed text. It's occasionally been dubbed Satan's Bible due to the interesting legend behind its origin. Now supposedly the story goes that a monk by the name of Herman the Reclus, Herman the Recluse, which same, honestly. Anyway, Herman was condemned to death for heresy and was to be walled up alive and starved. In a desperate plea to save himself, Herman tried to convince the prior and the abbot that if he could pen a manuscript to honor God's glory and contained all of human knowledge and history in one night that he could be let free. The abbot agreed, thinking that this was, of course, an impossible task. Well, he didn't know that Herman was the John Wick of penmanship, who wrote until midnight, wearing his fingertips down, and in a moment of desperation, made a prayer to Lucifer, and asked for his eternal soul in exchange for the book's completion in order to repent for his heresy. I totally get it, you know? I've done some pretty crazy things trying to write my scripts in time for a deadline too. I sold my soul earlier this week to get top five UFOs in on time. I get it. Now, not poking any holes in your logic here though, Herman, but I will say maybe, maybe selling your soul to the devil is part of the reason you got into this mess because that actually sounds a ton like heresy. A variation of the legend states that Herman worked for years on the manuscript, day and night, but still asked for the devil's assistance anyway, the lazy bastard. Anyway, the legend states that Satan signed the Bible with an illustration of himself. 
the ego on that guy. The book contains a birth of information. Like they said, it was supposed to be everything humanity had attained up to that point. Now these days, the Codex Gigas is preserved in the Natural Museum in Sweden, where you can admire the line work of Herman the Recluse and his ghost author, Satan. Number 3. The Grand Grimoire Our next entry has been formally referred to as the Gospel of Satan. It's different from Satan's Bible. And it's said to be a cursed book whose knowledge had to be sealed away to protect humanity. So this might be the most dangerous book ever published after Hop on Pop. The Grand Grimoire was said to have been penned by a priest in the 16th century who was possessed by a litany of demons who compelled the man to put their knowledge to paper. Acting as a scribe for the demons, the man wrote everything they knew about about dark incantations, spells, instructions on how to cast rituals, how to bind a demon to make it do your bidding. Wait, a demon wrote this book? A demon gave instructions about how it wants to be bound to a human and serve humans? That's a freaky little demon. That's not all though. There's a step-by-step -step recipe for a little necromancy if you're down to dabble in some dark arts and make some bones dance to your rhythm. The book really covers all the fun stuff you've been told not to do. Now, it's just it's not all brimstone and hellfire too. There's a rituals on how to manipulate your luck, how to conduct a seance, and I think this is adorable. But there's even ways to make people love you in the book. Now a little dating tip from your friends at Top 5 Scary, I will say if you need a demon's help to make them like you, that might not be the most successful relationship, but you do you, don't let me get in the way. Now if all of this is sounding pretty appealing, and I don't blame you because it all does sound really cool, just know that the book is considered high treason. Even so much as cracking the spine is considered equivalent to selling your soul, so maybe hold off on that Amazon order for a bit. Besides, because of the book's cursed reputation, the original copy is said to be locked away in the Vatican's famous secret archives, and no matter how many times you ask, they're not going to let you look at it, even if you say you just want to take a quick little peek at the illustrations. I know, so unfair. Ugh, I don't even have any late fees. Let me take the book out. Number two, the untitled grimoires. You think a book with a name is scary? Imagine a book without a name. Coming up next on our list of haunted nighttime reading is the untitled grimoires. It was so scary they couldn't even deign to give it a name. The books are said to originate from a Wiccan high priestess named Persephone Adarasta Irene, who has one of the coolest names I've ever heard. She recorded a book of her family's spiritual history. These manuscripts record Persephone's Wiccan history that she reworked all through her adult life. The first book contains around 250 pages of spells, incantations, curses, enchantments, and some information on gems, planets, rites, potions, and exorcisms. Basically anything and everything that a fledgling sorceress or warlock could ever possibly want. The second book is a little more light, you know, the sequel's a bit of a letdown. It's just alchemy, chemistry, cures, perfumes, and tonics. Now the first book is believed to be the one to carry the curse, as Persephone's spells are believed in Wiccan culture to contain more power than most other records due to her embodiment of her own soul inside the book. They say all authors put a bit of soul in their work, and it seems as if the Wiccan high priestess took that a bit more literally than most of us do. These books would eventually find their way into the possession of one Alice Montserrat, a close working associate of Alistair Crowley. Crowley, who you know from earlier in the video as one of the most famous practicers of the occult and lover of white horses. Montserrat left an inscription in the first page of the book, warning to all of those who open it, to those not of the craft, the reading of this book is forbidden. Proceed no further, or justice will exact a swift and terrible retribution, and you will surely suffer at the hands of the craft. This was written in several languages to make sure it came across to just about anybody who opened in the book. Now I'm kind of unclear on that. I don't know, some of the old words, the old English is kind of confusing me. Does that mean the book should be read like it's good? I, I don't know. Not really getting that. And finally coming in at our number one spot today on demonic dictionaries and evil literature is the infamous Lesser Key of Solomon. Make no mistake from the title, even though it's a Lesser Key of Solomon, it is not a lesser evil. It's an anonymously authored grimoire on demonology, so not written by Solomon. It's also known as Clavicula Solomonis Regis or Lemegeton, is a grimoire. It's a book of magic that gained significant prominence in occult literature. Now the grimoire is attributed to King Solomon, the biblical figure renowned for his wisdom and mastery over supernatural forces. It's believed to have been compiled in the 17th century, though it draws upon earlier occult tradition and texts. 
The lesser key consists of several sections or books, each focusing on a different aspect of magic and summoning. The most well known is the Ars Goetia, which represents descriptions and instructions for evoking 72 demons or spirits, each with its own unique powers and abilities, kind of like Pokemon. These demons are said to be bound by King Solomon and can be summoned and controlled by skilled practitioners. Other sections of the lesser key of Solomon include fan favorites like the Ars Theurgia Goetia, Ars Paulina, Ars Almadel, and Ars Notoria. These sections delve into topics such as angelic invocations, the use of talismans and amulets, and rituals for obtaining divine knowledge and wisdom. Now, The grimoire has had a profound influence on various occult and magical traditions, including ceremonial magic, demonology, and the practice of spirit conjuration. It has been studied and referenced by countless practitioners, scholars, and scary YouTubers throughout history. Now, you know. Goes without saying, this is a potentially dangerous text. The act of summoning and working with entities described in the grimoire is not for the faint of heart and really should be saved for those with a bit of spiritual expertise under their wizard hat. In conclusion, significant grimoire, very, very scary. I'm probably going to leave it closed for now. Number five on this list is Shams al Marif. This book, from my findings, is not inherently evil in its teachings, but is one of those examples of potentially being a bit too much power for one person to possess. It's a 13th century Arabic grimoire written by Ahmed al Buni. The book attempts to teach its readers how to perform ancient Arabic magic and is very spiritualistic. This book was super influential in Arabic culture and gained a large following. Many good things have come from this book, but also when you have a large amount of people following anything, some take it too far. Wikipedia writes, in contemporary form, the book consists of two volumes, Shams al-Marif al-Kubra and Shams al-Marif al-Sugra, the former being the larger of the two. The first few chapters introduce the reader to magic squares and the combination of numbers and the alphabet that are believed to bring magical effect, which the author insists is the only way to communicate with jinn, angels, and spirits. And that right there is one of the main teachings in this book, the ability to talk to spirits. The amount of scary stories that we've talked about on this channel though in regards to people trying to communicate with the dead is crazy and it shows just how often things like this can go wrong. This has obviously happened many a time with this book and those trying to reach their departed loved one end up contacting a super dangerous demon. I don't think that there's anything morally wrong with contacting the dead if the dead are okay with it of course. but. It seems like doing this always ends up with something bad happening. This grimoire won't curse you just by simply reading it, but if you try and perform some of the rituals it suggests, then it's very likely that you could cause some serious harm to you or those that you love. I recommend just avoiding this book altogether. Number four on this list is De Varmi Mystery. Now, the book in question here is actually a fictional book, and therefore it would be actually impossible for you to read it anyways, even if you wanted to for some reason. But that being said, it doesn't change the fact that it's definitely cursed and extremely evil. If this book was real, then we would need to get rid of it as soon as possible because it teaches humans how to do some very dangerous things. The book is part of the Lovecraftian universe and made its first appearance in The Secret of the tomb. The book isn't referenced too much in that story, but it's described in pretty good detail in the story The Black Bargain. In that book, it describes Devami Masai as something that told you how you could compound asinite and belladonna and draw circles of phosphorescent fire on the floor when the stars were right. Something that spoke of melting tallow candles and blending them with corpse fat, whispered of the uses to which animal sacrifices might be put. It spoke of meetings that could be arranged with various parties, most most people don't even believe in, with cold, deliberate directions for traffic with ancient evil. Drawing circles of fire, sacrificing animals, talking with ancient evil, this all sounds like pretty bad news to me. Especially the part that says you can arrange meetings with various parties. It's clear that not only can this book teach someone how to perform any number of spells and incantations, but some of those spells will deal with the summoning of ancient demons and creatures. And if we assume that this book is real and can be read, then that would also mean that the terrifyingly powerful gods Lovecraft wrote about would also be real. Meaning that this book could grant you the ability to summon Cthulhu or something even worse. Summoning your standard demon is already bad 
bad enough, but an all-knowing, super powerful god definitely raises the stakes a little bit. This book, from every description I can read about, sounds like something that's just far too dangerous for any human to use and wield safely. If it ever was real and you did happen to stumble upon it, best to avoid reading it at all costs. Number three on this list is the Book of Abramelin. Abraham was an Egyptian mage who lived between 1362 and 1458 and dedicated his life to magic. Once Abraham visited Egypt and there he met a magician, not that magician which you see on TV shows, but that who really knows dark magic and dark secrets. He told Abraham many dark and mysterious secrets and strange things which you and I can never imagine. He told him how to live the dead person, the location of under earth treasures, how to contact devils. Besides this, he also told him the secrets of becoming invisible and flying in the sky. That last passage that I just read was written by Sharik Kamal while he was listing the most cursed books of all time. This book is known to be dangerous and it isn't just because of the contents in it either. Yes, summoning the dead and performing dark magic in its own right is very dangerous and has the potential to cause serious problems for you and those around you. This book though may just be inherently cursed to begin with. Many people who have read this book, even those who don't go on to perform any of the rituals or incantations that the book describes, have gotten horribly bad luck afterwards. Like the second they opened up the book and started reading, their entire life just flipped on its side. Some have said that afterwards their home became haunted by some dark spirit and they had to move. It's almost as if the book itself is a portal to another demonic dimension and just the action of opening it could cause something to leak out. I'm sure that Abraham was a great writer but no book is worth dying over so I won't be reading this one anytime soon. Number two on this list is The Great Omar. This book is believed to be the cause of one of the most tragic disasters in all of human history. Sinking the unsinkable ship, the Titanic. No, you don't catch Leonardo DiCaprio reading this book in the 1997 movie version, but maybe he should have. This book, even though it is deeply cursed, is potentially the most ornate and beautiful books to have ever been created. In fact, it took over 2,500 hours to create this book, which translates to over 100 full days. One would think that a book of this kind would fetch quite the pretty penny, but that actually wasn't the case. In fact, the man who binded this book, Francis Sangorski, had an extremely hard time trying to sell it to anyone. Finally, he did find a home for it in America and was in the process of sending it over there. But it never reached its destination though because it was on the Titanic. Now the reason that people think this book had something to do with the unsinkable ship sinking is because only a week or so after the ship had gone down, so did Sangorski. He died by drowning to death a very short time after the book had also sunk to the bottom of the ocean. This is why people believe that something about this book will curse those around it and potentially lead to someone drowning. I personally think it's a bit of a stretch to just assume that having this book caused the entire Titanic to sink. However, it is a remarkable coincidence what happened to Sangorski. It probably won't ever happen, but if this book ever did wash ashore one day, I wouldn't want to be the one to pick it up first. Number one on this list is the Book of Soiga. The Book of Soiga is one of the most complete collections of magic and dark magic that one could come across. Wikipedia writes, amongst the incantations and instructions on magic, astrology, demonology, lists of conjunctions, lunar mansions, and names of genealogies of angels, the book contains 36 large squares of letters which D was unable to decipher. Otherwise, un known medieval magical treaties are cited including works known as the Liber E, Liber O's, Liber Dignus, Liber Sipple, and Liber Muno. So we'll get to those letters in a second because those play into the cursed nature of this book, but even without those, we're still dealing with a book that goes into depth on some pretty dangerous topics. The one that jumps off the page to me as being potentially problematic is demonology. The study of demons and the hierarchy to them and also the study of how to potentially summon them. This is certainly problematic and already a reason to not read this book, but let's get back to those letters. In 1608, there lived a man named John D. John D was fascinated with this book and wanted to figure out how to decode the letters. He reached out to the angel Uriel, and Uriel told him that only the worthy one will be able to crack the code. Truly a chosen one scenario where the book will reveal its secrets to the one that it decides. John D tried to decode it anyways, but then 
a grim fate befell him and he died. Then, very mysteriously, the book disappeared from the face of the earth for almost 400 years, until it all of a sudden reappeared in 1994. Now, it's thought that trying to decode these letters could prove fatal if you aren't the one worthy to do so. There's over 7 billion people on the planet, so the odds that you're the one worthy one and won't die are pretty slim. Not the sort of odds that I'd want to take just to look at some strange medieval letters. Number 5 on this list is the Treaties of the Vessels. The year is 1981. Harrison Ford has already taken the big screen a few times, but is he a leading actor? Yes, Raiders of the Lost Ark takes to the screen and the beautiful George Lucas and Steven Spielberg brainchild officially solidifies Harrison Ford as being an elite A-lister in Hollywood. Well, this beautiful brainchild of theirs didn't just come out of thin air, but it was very likely inspired by the Treaties of the Vessels. This text is said to talk about some priceless treasures from King Solomon along with the Ark of the Covenant. If found, these would be some of the most valuable things ever rediscovered in all of human history. When there's gold, people are going to come, and the same thing applies here. There are riches galore to be found if someone is able to get to the bottom of this mystery and the secrets may be within the treaties of the vessels. The thing is, it doesn't tell you the exact location of the Ark, so our daring explorers will need to find out for themselves. In case you didn't know, the Ark of the Covenant is said to hold tablets containing the Ten Commandments. The rest of the treasure is described in the treaties as being 77 tables of gold and their gold was from the walls of the Garden of Eden that was revealed to Solomon. And they radiated like the radiance of the sun and moon which radiate at the height of the world. So yeah, it's all pretty freaking good stuff. Although, I don't know if y'all remember the end of Harrison Ford's massive breakout movie, but discovering the Ark of the Covenant may not be the best thing ever. In fact, it's said that touching the Ark of the Covenant will result in death by the hands of God. That's why some people think this whole thing is cursed. Yes, if you actually found this thing, then you might be the most wealthy person in the world, but it may also kill you in the process. You also may never find it at all and dedicate your life to nothing. I'd say that you can probably read this thing, just leave the exploring to our main man Indy. Number 4 on this list is the Voynich Manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript is definitely an interesting one, largely because no one has any idea what it's saying. This is a 250 page book where pretty much all of the words are in an unfamiliar language that we can't seem to decipher. The reason that people think this thing is inherently cursed isn't just because of the gibberish though, it's because of the pictures that go along with said gibberish. Cosmological symbols, weird plants doing weird things, and nude women doing some other weird things are all over this book. It should also be stated that the manner of the drawings are just plain creepy. Like there's nothing inherently evil or cursed about a plant or a naked woman, but the way that the book has drawn them out really does give me some serious devil vibes. Because of this, people worry that the book may be cursed. That potentially this is a book from the underworld which somehow made its way to our world. This is why we can't understand the words, but a demon would be able to pick it up no problem. Experts have researched the language and although they don't know what it is, have discovered some hallmarks that indicate it is a real language of some kind. Therefore, it could be some kind of demonic tongue that we aren't familiar with. Granted, it could also be some other ancient language that's just been lost in time. Demonic language or ancient language, I think based on the drawings, it's clear that whatever is said is probably not PG stuff. Who knows how many gruesome or questionable things this book has been part of in its lifetime. Considering you wouldn't be able to read it anyways, I'd just avoid it altogether. Number 3 on this list is the Handbook of Ritual Power. Anything called the Handbook of Ritual Power probably deserves to be on the list. Owen Jarvis details this book nicely by writing, This 20 page codex dates back around 1300 years and is written in Coptic. It contains a variety of magical spells and formulas including love spells, spells for curing black jaundice, and instructions on how to perform an exorcism. The text may have been written by a group of Sethians, an ancient Christian sect who held Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve, in high regard. The opening of the text references a mysterious figure named Bakhtiotha whose identity is unknown. 
I give thanks to you and I call upon you, the Bakhtiotha, the Great One who is very untrustworthy, the one who is Lord over the forty and the nine kinds of serpents, a translation of the text reads. The researchers who translated and analyzed the text call it a handbook of ritual power. It is now housed at the Museum of Ancient Cultures at Macquarie University in Sydney. The university purchased the codex in 1981 from a Vienna-based antiquities dealer named Michael Fackelman. Where Fackelman got it from is unknown. Spells, formulas, black jaundice, all of this sounds quite a lot like some of the other books that we've looked at in the first two parts of this series. A book that probably teaches humans some skills that we simply aren't ready to receive. A book that, if it fell into the wrong hands, somebody with evil intentions, could prove to be really, really bad. There are things that need to be left in the hands of higher beings, and making somebody fall in love with someone else may just be one of them. Keep this book locked up and away from prying eyes. Number two on this list is the Dresden Codex. Owen Jarvis details once again the Dresden Codex beautifully by writing, The Dresden Codex is a Mayan text dating back around 800 years. It contains 39 beautifully illustrated sheets with texts and images on both sides. Research published in 2016 in the Journal of Astronomy and Culture indicates that the Codex records the phases of the planet Venus so that the Maya would be certain that their ceremonial events were being held on the correct day. The Maya had a really elaborate ritual set of events that were tied to the calendar. Study researcher Geraldo Aldana, a science historian at the University of California, Santa Barbara, told Live Science. They were probably doing large-scale ritual activities connected to the different phases of Venus. Now, for those who don't know, Venus, albeit a very beautiful planet, is often tied to Lucifer. It should also be noted that the Mayans were known to perform the occasional human sacrifice, and I don't think it's a stretch to say that this text most likely contains dates when human sacrifices are to be performed. The Dresden Codex would have acted as an agenda to make sure that our Mayans kept on track with their sacrificial rituals to honor Venus. For this reason, it's thought that this codex is cursed with the souls of those who were sacrificed. It's also very dangerous to perform any of these rituals as they will likely involve the loss of human life and potentially reaching out to some very dangerous gods. This is the oldest surviving Maya book and for that reason needs to be kept around for research, but I wouldn't recommend the average person giving it a read. And finally, number one on this list is Liber Linatus. This text is currently considered to be the longest lasting Etruscan text in all of history. It dates back to the 3rd century BCE, and because not much is known about the Etruscan language, it remains mostly untranslated. However, experts who study such things have been able to decipher some of it and have discovered that the text was a ritual calendar. A collection of dates with specific rituals to be performed on said dates. The exact details of these rituals are unknown, but we assume them to be centered around human sacrifices and things of that nature. This is already enough to fear this book, but what makes it inherently cursed is how the pages were used for several thousand years. Mihailo Beric was a low-ranking Croatian official who, in 1848, decided to leave his position and travel to Egypt. While he was there, he decided to purchase a sarcophagus with a mummy inside. Why someone would want a coffin with a preserved dead body in it is beyond me, but apparently this was pretty cool to own back then. Anyways, he takes this mummy back to his home in Vienna and stands it upright in the corner of one of his rooms. It wasn't until after he died though and his brother donated the mummy to the State Institute of Croatia that somebody realized what the mummy was covered with. The bandages that preserved the mummy were covered in writing. These bandages were the Liber Linatus and had been used as rags for this mummy for centuries. Now this text is locked in a refrigerated room in the Archaeological Museum of Croatia and for good reason. Not only is the writing of this text potentially very dangerous, but people believe that the spirit of this dead mummy haunts the rags and that they're cursed. Those that come into contact with them, or God forbid read them, could have some very tragic events befall them. For this reason, I highly recommend staying away from the Liber Linatus at all costs. Number five, the complete book of demonolatry. Written by S. Connolly, it boasts telling the reader how to discover powerful rites, magic, and practices that honor Satan and the demons. This text, used by the traditional demonolatry priesthood to train members of their covens, is part workbook, part textbook, and part reference book. It includes thorough chapters on demonolatry, history, demonic holy days, offerings, prayers, sigils, religious rites, 
and an introduction to demonology magic. Okay, this might be the first book I'm tempted to buy for myself. If only just to learn more about like demonology history from somebody that isn't, you know, like Ed Warren for once. I love the Warrens and their work, but at the same time, it would be neat to learn from a lens that isn't, you know, as biased in Catholicism. All right, let's see what else it advertises. Learn how and why the ends, demonology sigils, ascension, and many other demonology methods have become standard practice among many theistic Satanists. It claims to guide students from pre initiate to adept, and even delves into the depths of demonolatry, um, schmeck's magic, necromancy, scarlet elixir rites, and red fluid sacrifice. See, that last phrase I can do without. But let me know what y'all think in the comments. Should I bother investing in it or not? Now before anybody asks, well why should you leave this book alone on Halloween? That just so happens to be when the veil between our world and the spirit world is the thinnest and you don't want to accidentally summon a demon when you're just learning how to. Not a fun idea. Uh, number four, Mein Kampf. Alrighty folks, this is where I'm using demonic as more as an adjective instead of actually talking about demons. Also this is a book that should never be consumed in general. More like exist in a museum so that we keep, you know, don't turn into a case of those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. This is an autobiography of German Germany's infamous, actually Austrian born dictator, whose name I can't say on here. Its title means my struggle or battle, because you know, organizing genocide is hard work. Didn't you know? Everybody clap for this man's tenacity, his perseverance, his sheer determination. Hard work makes dreams come true, don't you know? Ugh, the prick. The book, released in two volumes, is in reality the evil dictator's case for anti Semitism. He outlines exactly how he came to be as he was before putting forth his racial and political views and describing his vision for the future of Germany. From a technical point of view, this book is apparently overly long, repetitious, and poorly written. You know, seeing as it was written by one of the world's most evil men in history, it was deemed just cause for banning it in Austria and Russia. Interestingly enough, Germany held the copyright over this book until 2016. Until then, printing and dissemination of the work was strictly banned. But now that it's, you know, in the public domain, Germany has lifted the ban and actually released a new edition with nearly 2,000 pages and 3,500 annotated notes. I'm not sure this particular book should be available, simply because it was written by the man I cannot name. You know, the fact that he killed 6 million people for no fault of their own is unforgivable enough, but the conditions he kept them and many more in is making me sick to my stomach. So we're gonna move on before I start venting and get off topic today. Number three, the Grand Grimoire. It is a black magic grimoire, and for reference, a grimoire is a textbook of magic that typically includes instructions on how to create magical objects like talismans and amulets, how to perform magical spells, charms, and divination, and how to summon or invoke supernatural entities such as angels, spirits, deities, and demons. In many cases, the books themselves are believed to be imbued with magical powers, although in many cultures, other sacred texts that are not grimoires, such as the Bible, have been believed to have supernatural properties intrinsically. The only contents found in a grimoire would be information on spells, rituals, the preparation of magical tools, and lists of ingredients and their magical correspondences. In this manner, while all books on magic could be thought of as grimoires, not all magical books should be thought of as grimoires. Different editions date the specific one to 1521, 22, or even like as early as 1421, but it was probably written during like the early 19th century. Some experts suggest that 1702 is when the first edition may have been created in a Bibliothèque Bleu version, similar to like a chapter book, of the text might have been published in 1750. The introductory chapter was authored by Antonio Veneciana da Rabina, who gathered his information from the original writings of King Solomon. Much of the material of this grimoire derives from the Key of Solomon and the Lesser Key of Solomon, which are grimoires attributed to the king of the same name. Also known as Le Dragon Rouge or the Red Dragon, this book contains instructions on how to summon Lucifer or Lucifer Jrefocal for the purpose of forming a deal with the devil. The 19th century French occultist Ephilphaz Lévy, author of Dogme et de la haute magie, claimed the contemporary edition of Le Dragon Rouge was a counterfeit of a true older Grand Grimoire. And I just, I love petty historical spats. Once again, the overall work is divided into two books. So the first book contains instructions for summoning a demon and the construction of tools with which to force a demon to do one's bidding. The second book is divided further into two parts, the Sanctum Regnum and Secrets de l'Art Magique du Grand Grimoire. The Sanctum Regnum contains instructions for making a pact with the demon, allowing one to command the spirit without the tools required by book one, but at greater risk. Secrets contain secret spells and rituals one can employ after having performed the ritual of the first book. Now, some editions contain a short text between the two parts, known as Le Secret Magique, ou Le Grand Art de Pouvoir Parler aux Morts, or in English, The Magic Secret or the Grand Art of Being Able to Speak with the Dead, which deals with necromancy. The book describes several demons as well as the rituals to summon them in order to make a pact with them. It also details several spells for winning a lottery, talking to spirits, being loved by somebody else, making oneself invisible, and more. This book mentions three greater demons, which are similarly prioritized in the Grimorium Verum. Sidebar, in the English translation of the work, the demons are referenced by the more generic term of spirits, which is a term I know some modern Satanists prefer. The demons that are mentioned are the Emperor Lucifer, Prince Beelzebub, Prince Beelzebub, and the Grand
Grand Duke Astaroth. Now, this work also makes mention of six lesser demons, and of course, I'll mention them all: Lucifer, Revocal, Prime Minister, Saint Natia, Commander in Chief, Aglia Rept, Commandant, Fleurti, Lieutenant General, Sagatanas, Brigadier Major, Nebiros, Marshal, and Inspector General. I had fun with that. Number two, the Grimorium Verum. Hmm, I just mentioned this, didn't I? The Grimorium Verum, which is Latin for true grimoire, is an 18th century grimoire attributed to one Ali Beck the Egyptian of Memphis, who wrote it in 1517, and like many grimoires, it claims a tradition originating with King Solomon. This grimoire is actually not a translation of an earlier work, with its original appearing in French or Italian in the mid-18th century, as noted by A. E. Waite, who discussed the work in his book of ceremonial magic in 1911, stating the date specified in the title of the Grimorium Verum is undeniably fraudulent since the work belongs to the middle of the 18th century and Memphis is Rome. One version of the grimoire was included as the Clavicles of King Solomon Book 3 in one of the French manuscripts S. L. McGregor Mathers, incorporated in his version of the Key of Solomon, but it was omitted from the key with its explanation. At the end, there are some short extracts from the Grimorium Verum with the seals of evil spirits, which, as they do not belong to the Key of Solomon proper, I have not given. For the evident classification of the key is in two books and no more. Idris Shah also published some of it in the Secret Lore of Magic, Book of the Sorcerers, in 1957. Alrighty, time to break down all four books that you should not be touching on Halloween. Book one is described as concerning the character of demons, particularly the superior spirits of Lucifer, Beelzebub, Astaroth, while also including the many inferior spirits below them and their invoking sig ah, while also including the many inferior spirits below them and their invoking sigils. Alright, who wants to hear about what all the lesser spirits can do? Klonek has the power to bring money to those who make a pact with them. Musisin has power over important people and politicians. Freemost has power over women. Yeah, okay, bow. Klepoth can help you experience all sorts of dreams and visions. Kill can manifest dramatic situations and changes. Mersild has dominion over long and short distance travel. Klisthert can create confusion or enlightenment depending on what you need or want. Sir Chad can make you see all sorts of natural and supernatural creatures. Hickback can make a person think of you, no matter how far or distant they may be. Humots can bring you any book you desire. Siegel will cause all sorts of prodigies to appear. Fruxisier can teach you the art of necromancy. Gulind causes all illnesses. Sergak can create every kind of opportunity for advancement. Morail can help you move about unseen. Frutimier prepares all kinds of feasts for you. Hoitigaras causes sleep in the case of some and insomnia in others. And hey, tempting, because I could use a good night's sleep right about now. Book two is simply described as being a planetary hours, so I'll leave it up to y'all to interpret what you think it means. Book three is the preparation of the operator, or more simply put, how to prepare for summoning. A more modern title could be Demon Summoning for Dummies, or How to Summon a Demon 101. Book 4 contains the Sanctum Regnum, also called the Royalty of Spirits, or the Little Key of Solomon, a most learned Hebraic necromancer and rabbi. This book contains various combinations of characters whereby the powers can be invoked or brought forth whensoever you may wish, each according to his faculty. Long story short, it's a very descriptive and thorough demon summoning bible if you will. Once again, I personally do not recommend summoning demons, but if you really feel Feel like you must. This feels like it would produce safer outcomes than, say, like a random YouTube ritual or a Ouija board. But still, stay away on Halloween. You don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what's gonna happen. It's not fun. Number one, the 120 Days of Sodom. Written in Bastille during the French Revolution, the author was interrupted when the prison was stormed by insurgents and never finished the story. But 120 Days remains amongst the most notorious works of literature, featuring depraved fetishes, red fluid soaked sexual group parties, torment, and under the age of consent, bad, icky, Schmeck's thing. Look, I'd say the actual terms if I could. Trust me, it would make my life so much easier, but I've got to play by the interweb rules. Described as very sexual and erotic, its plot revolves around the activities of four wealthy libertine men who spend four months seeking out the ultimate sexual gratification through group sex fun parties, sealing themselves away in an inaccessible castle in the heart of the Black Forest in Germany with four madams and a harem of 36 victims, mostly young people. The madams relate stories of their most memorable clients, whose crimes and punishments inspired the Libertines to likewise and increasingly harm their victims to their eventual deaths. Now, the novel was never completed. Its first chapter was written according to Say's written plan, but the subsequent chapters are in the form of rough drafts and notes, often consisting of graphic descriptions of the novel scenes. The book was first published in Germany back in 1904 and then banned across Europe for most of the 20th century. A 1975 film adaptation by Pier Paolo Pasolini was also banned in several countries. South Korea has banned the book twice a century, and now it can be sold there only in a sealed plastic cover to adults 19 or over. Once again, don't read it. If cursing power were based solely on a book's size, the Codex Gigas, otherwise known as the Devil's Bible, would probably be the most dangerous book ever written. Weighing in at a whopping 165 pounds and measuring about 3 feet in height, the roughly 800 year old tome is thought to be the world's largest surviving medieval manuscript. Codex Gigas literally means a giant book. 
It doesn't get any more simple than that, folks. The manuscript's exact origins have been lost to time, but historians believe it was written at some point between 1204 and 1230 in the Kingdom of Bohemia, part of what would become the Czech Republic. According to the National Library of Sweden, the book was owned by at least three different monasteries before Emperor Rudolf II added it to his private collection, which would also soon include the Voynich Manuscript in 1594. Now, I won't necessarily be talking about that manuscript today, but it's an approximately 600-year-old mystery that continues to stump scholars, cryptographers, physicists, and computer scientists. That one is a roughly only 240-page medieval codex written in an indecipherable language, brimming with bizarre drawings of esoteric plants, nude women, and astrological symbols. It defies classification, much less comprehension. So not cursed, but still a good mystery. Sorry, I know. Sidetracked again. ADHD is fun. Back to the codex we go. In 1648, it was claimed by the Swedish army during the Thirty Years' War and taken to Stockholm, and has been housed in Sweden's National Library since 1768. While many illuminated texts were produced by teams of scribes, scholars believe the Codex Gigas is the work of a single copyist. Written entirely in Latin, the book contains both the Old and New Testaments, along with Czech and Jewish history texts, an encyclopedia with information on geometry, legal matters and entertainment, among other topics, medical stuff, hundreds of obituaries, several several magic spells, and a calendar. Just a good catch-all anthology if you ask me. You got a little bit of everything. The book's sinister reputation stems from a full-color portrait of the devil contained in its pages, and a legend about how the image got there. So if we're going to consult the folklore, the book is the work of a monk. Possibly, let's see if I get this right, Hermanus Hermitus, or Herman the Recluse, who had broken his vows and been sentenced to be walled up alive in the monastery. He had struck a deal to save himself. If, over the course of a single night, he could write a book containing all the world's knowledge, his life would be spared. When he realized the task was impossible, because no SHIT Sherlock, the monk sold his soul to the devil, who helped him finish the book and signed it with the now infamous portrait. Other versions of the story say the monk added the illustration as a gesture of gratitude for Satan's assistance, but nevertheless, the portrait is there, and boy oh boy is it off to look at. There are several tales of misfortune attached to the codex, but the curse seems to be fairly benign, when you consider the book was apparently also co-written by Beelzebub. One legend dating back to at least 1858 maintains that a guard was institutionalized after being accidentally locked in Sweden's National Library overnight, and he was supposedly found under a table the next morning, claiming to have seen the Codex join a procession of books as they danced through the air. Yeah, not a book I plan on visiting anytime soon. Written in the early 1600s by Martin de Leon Cardenas, the orphan story is a novel about a young Spaniard who heads to the Americas in search of fortune. Well, it may sound like a normal adventure story, and an outlier amongst the magical books I'm about to talk about today. A major darkness lurks within its pages that led to the novel not being published until 2018. The first draft was a 328-page manuscript that was slightly yellowed, a little bit worn, a little bit aged, missing a couple of pages. Which, you know, on the surface sounds pretty tame, but you've got to assume otherwise if I'm making a point of it. It is handwritten in a decorative style reflective of the golden or imperial age. I'm not super sure. The new age print takes on a more modern bound look, featuring artwork from the original manuscript on the front, in a rather plain book front past that. Belinda Peliasos, a Peruvian scholar who edited the book for two years, says that she was warned by multiple people about this manuscript. It was first set to appear in 1621 under the pen name of Andres de Leon, but never made it to the press due to the presidential atmosphere at the time in Sicily. If you know, you know. The manuscript then sat in the Hispanic Society of America until 1965 when Belinda rediscovered it. She learned about the many attempts to publish the story, giving rise to rumors that malevolent energy lurked among the pages, causing the people who worked on it to pass. In an interview, she commented on the reported deaths, saying one was from a strange disease, another in a car accident, and something, something, something else for the other. Belinda had also heard from other professors she was working with to publish the book, one who specialized in colonial letters from the Andean regions in Mexico, who was named Raquel Chang Rodriguez. Raquel's letters describe how Antonio Rodriguez Manino and William C. Bryant both died before finishing their editions of the book, and that's why the manuscript is believed to be cursed or bewitched. They told her that the book was cursed. And the reason it took them so long to publish that was, well, if you work on it, you're gonna die in some sort of weird, mysterious way. Did the powers that be not want the ancient script out in the world? Note to self, don't go within 10 feet of the book. Not worth it. Here's an obvious inclusion into our list today, the Necronomicon. Look, I should get brownie points somewhere for holding out for a year before talking about this gem. Inspired by an H.P. Lovecraft story, this book was published in the 70s by an anonymous author only identified by the pen name Simon, believed to actually be Peter Lavenda, but 
can't prove that. The first editions, of which I'm not kidding, only 666 copies were released, were bound in leather, but later on it would be published in paperback, becoming an immediate bestseller. In this version's prologue, Simon claims that this is no fictional book, but a translation of a Greek manuscript containing the Necronomicon. The introduction to the book, which is about 80 pages of the 263, is the only part that Simon claims were written. It relates how Simon and his associates were introduced to a Greek translation of the Necronomicon, I love saying that word, by a mysterious monk. Simon claims that after experimenting with the text, they verified that the work is a genuine collection of magical rituals that predates most known religions, and warns that anyone attempting to use this might unleash dangerous forces. In addition to an introduction, the book uses a framed story titled The Testimony of the Mad Era. The testimony is in two parts forming a prologue and an epilogue to the core. The author describes himself as, you guessed it, Mad Arab. I'll just call it Mad. The prologue explains how Mad first came to discover the dark secret that he's recording, accidentally witnessing an arcane ritual performed by a cult that worships Tiamat, in which both the demons Cthulhu and Humwawa are conjured. In the epilogue, Mad is haunted by premonitions of his gruesome death. He realizes that the horrors of the Necronomicon are enraged and seek revenge upon him for revealing their existence to the world. He is unable to sign his work and thus remains nameless. This version mixes pseudo-Sumerian mythology with Lovecraft's universe, and it includes rituals that supposedly allow the reader to summon the gods and demons of these myths. It has also been linked to the Satanic Church, as it kind of alludes to Aleister Crowley's teachings. And if you know anything about that name, you'll understand why that's a name to be worried about being associated with anything. Ever heard of Tomino's Hell? Rather than a full book, bear with me here, it's a cursed poem included in Sakin, a poem compilation dating back to 1919 by a Japanese poet and songwriter. It tells the journey of a Tomino, a young boy who has been sent to hell after he committed an unforgivable sin. The poem later served as an inspiration for a film called Pastoral to Die in the Country. The filmmaker died nine years later, and well, the poem was blamed for it. Since then, it has become an instant urban legend, suggesting that anybody who reads the poem will either die in a couple of days, or eh, be haunted by Tomino's spirit. Six one way, half a dozen the other, right? And finally for today, the Book of Soiga is an occult text that dates back to at least the 1500s. We only know about it because it was once owned by John Dee, a famous 16th century polymath whose fields of study and expertise included mathematics, physics, chemistry, and astronomy. Dee was also an occultist who was particularly interested in communicating with angels. This book must have been irresistible to him. Besides magical spells and writings about demonology and astrology, the text includes the names and genealogies of angels. Look, it's a nice exchange from the usual books of demons I hear about. Let me have this one. According to Benjamin Woolley's D biography, The Queen's Conjurer, D believed the book contained an ancient, even divine message written in the language originally spoken to Adam. In other words, the true unspoiled word of God. I know a lot of people who would love to see that. It also includes 36 cryptic tables that remained undeciphered for centuries. D attempted to crack their code with the help of Edward Kelly, a crystal gazer who convinced D he could channel the voices of angels. Kelly sometimes spelled his name by K-E-L-L-Y instead of being K-E-L-L-E-Y, or went by Edward Talbot. Having aliases was probably helpful to the supposed medium, who had reportedly been convicted of counterfeiting and might have had his ears cut off as punishment. According to Sky History, Dee was so eager to talk to angels that when Kelly told him the angels wanted the two men to swap wives for an evening as payment for celestial communication, Dee was like, heck yes. Nine months later, Theodore was born. You know, that's something you don't hear about every day. He was in Kelly as he go between, Dee dialed up the archangel Uriel and asked him if the Book of Soiga was a real deal. Uriel, speaking through Kelly, assured him that it was, but told him that only the archangel Michael was authorized to translate the tables, but he wasn't available, a uh, busy schedule or something. This exchange might be the source of the Book of Soiga's reputation as a cursed book, or as it is sometimes known, the book that kills. At one point, Dee mentioned to Uriel that he'd been told he'd die within two and a half years if he ever read the encoded text. Uriel assured Dee that he'd live for more than 100 years. Dee died in 1608 at the age of 81. The book changed hands a couple of times before vanishing from historical record. Fast forward 300 years, summer of 1994, Deborah Harkness had just finished her doctoral dissertation and was browsing through the catalog at Oxford's Bodleian Library when she found a reference to the text in question. She had the book brought up and soon found herself staring at the holy grail of Dee's scholarship. The experience inspired her first novel, The Discovery of Witches, which kicked off a best-selling trilogy and has since been adapted for television, which love to see it. In 1998, mathematician Jim Reeds cracked the code of its mysterious tables. Reeds discovered a pattern involving the frequency and position of certain letters in relation to the other letters, or in his words, a letter is obtained by counting a certain number of letters after to the letter immediately above it in the table. Make it that what you will. Reeds came up with a set of mathematical formulae that allowed him to decipher the tables, each of which turned out to be based on a six letter code word. But we still don't know the meaning of those code words, or what messages the tables were meant to communicate, or if there even is one, maybe someday. Coming in at number five, we've got the Grand Grimoire. 
Well, with a name like that, you'd better hope it's imbued with some terrible power, otherwise, what's the point? We discussed a grimoire in our last video that was more directed towards witches and other followers of Wicca. If you're part of that group, it's safe to read, otherwise, you'd better watch out. This one is just straight up evil, according to some. And when a book is this jam packed with horrid, abominable information, people tend to take notice. It's been referred to as the Gospel of Satan, which is a fun genre to imagine. However, I would hazard a guess that most modern Satanists want nothing to do with it, as they tend to be more peace loving and accepting. Back in the 16th century, a man claimed to be possessed by the devil. Whether this was Satan proper or one of many hideous demons inhabiting the fires of hell, I guess we may never know. Lots of demons who inhabit the bodies of the living like to pretend they're something that they're not, so I wouldn't be surprised if this was inspired by a different being than Satan himself. However, that doesn't make it any less scary. Some say that this is the deadliest book going with lots of stories to back it up. Those who read it are privy to some incredibly dark secrets, from doom bringing incantations to demon summoning guides. You don't just get these lessons for free though. All this eldritch knowledge comes at a price. By simply opening the book and reading from its pages, you're essentially offering up your soul to whatever dark forces inhabit it. And the longer you stick around, reading away, the more likely it is that something will take what is most precious to you. Usually reading plenty is good for you, but in this case, you're playing with fire. The Grand Grimoire is rumored to be so dangerous that people have locked it away in the depths of the Vatican, protected by all sorts of holy implements. Others say that the real Grimoire is still out there somewhere, circulating between occultists and evil spirits. This legend has staying power, and many have taken the idea of such a book and added it to other stories, from movies to video games to urban legends. Who knows, maybe the real Grand Grimoire is sitting in some unassuming thrift shop waiting to be picked up by the right person. Coming in at number 4, we've got Homino's Hell. Veering off in a very different direction, we're going to take a look at a book that doesn't necessarily have hundreds of years of curses and evil energy imbued within it. Compared to a lot of these other books, it's a relatively new haunted tale, one hailing from Japan. It doesn't even need to physically be in the possession of the person reading it, all it takes to be cursed by this poem is to read it aloud. That's dangerous. Stories of this damned poem started showing up after the author, Saijo Yaso, published a collection of his work in 1919, so I guess it is over a hundred years old now. Huh. After losing family members in World War I, he took the grief and pain he was experiencing and put it into words. It's not a very long poem, so you could definitely read it in one sitting. I'm not going to read it aloud today for obvious reasons, but we can do our best to summarize the tale and delve into the haunted story. A lot of the details are left up to interpretation, but the general idea here is that it tells the tragic tale of an abused girl who was left to die by her family. Not a pretty picture. Years later, as rumors circulated, a director decided to make a film based on the poem. After completing his project, he suddenly died with no explanation, causing people to worry even more. This helped the poem make its way into circulation as an urban legend. The internet helped a great deal, and a recounting of the tale in a more modern book did wonders as well. So nobody can be exactly sure where the cursed nature of the poem originated, whether it was the internal turmoil of Saijo Yasso, the unfortunate end of the director, or the general negative energy associated with it in the eye of the public. Regardless, this is one piece of writing that you do not want to be reciting. If you're extra brave though, give it a shot. Let me know how it goes. I will not be taking that risk today. Coming in at number 3, we've got the Book of Abramelin. Heading back in the direction of spellcasting and dark magic, here we have a tome written from the teachings of a mage. Apparently back in the 16th century, a traveling writer named Abraham came across an old wizened mage. This man had seen it all and was privy to some of the world's darkest secrets. The mage told Abraham all he knew and Abraham took those lessons and wrote them down in a book. Interestingly enough, he dedicated this tome to his son. What's better than a book of forbidden knowledge from the old man, right? This mage taught Abraham many things, from how to raise the dead to how to conjure destructive spells. To achieve many of these effects, one would have to find and control their own personal demon. This act is very dangerous, as if the demon decides to break free, all hell could break loose. Literally. However, for those with the discipline and questionable morals to pull off such a feat, they could achieve things that many only dream of. Invisibility, flying, discovering hidden treasures, the works. At the turn of the 20th century, an English translation of the book was published, leading to all sorts of new rumors of curses and evil magic. So if you do manage to get your hands on a copy, be careful while perusing the contents. Coming in at number 2, the Voynich Manuscript. Mysterious and malevolent, nobody has successfully decoded the contents of this book yet. That lack of understanding may contribute to its terrible power. 
For now, the safest thing to do would be to leave it alone, but curiosity always kills the cat. The origins are foggy at best, with many thinking that it dates back to the 15th century. However, others claim that aliens brought this book to Earth with the intent of destroying many inquisitive minds. While the book is now surrounded by rumors and claims that it brings misfortune wherever it goes, the decoding of the contents could bring about even more misery. It's said that whoever reads the book and understands it will release a powerful curse onto the world, one that will kill them, their loved ones, and anyone who investigates it further. It could even be a doomsday prophecy, with the successful reading of it leading to worldwide destruction. It's good to be inquisitive and look for new things, but I think this mystery is one best left unsolved. And finally at number one, we've got the Necronomicon. Literary historians would tell you that this is a made up book invented by the father of cosmic horror himself, H.P. Lovecraft. He mentions such a tome in many of his bone chilling stories as a source of great eldritch knowledge and a portal into realms unknown. It's a great plot device and symbol for all that man should not be privy to. However, a lot of people don't believe the story ends there. Some believe that Lovecraft lifted this idea from a real book, one that's existed for ages and brings about chaos wherever it travels. We're no strangers to horrific incantations and demonic chants on this channel, so this should come as no surprise. But leaders of cults and crazies alike would love to get their hands on this book. It's been adapted and recreated for many purposes, showing up in alternate forms in pop culture at large. Often crafted from human flesh and full of images of unimaginable horrors, those who possess it inevitably go mad and summon something horrid into our world. The original Necronomicon is rumored to be under the watchful eye of the church, while others think that scholars of the ancient arts have been studying it for time immemorial. Regardless, don't go in expecting some light summer reading. Those who learn the teachings of the Necronomicon don't often remain sane or even human. Number 5 on this list is the Sworn Book of Honorius. This is an ancient medieval grimoire that was very influential and was apparently written by Honorius of Thebes. I say that word apparently because it's currently unknown whether Honorius of Thebes was actually a real person or a complete myth. If he was real, then he's said to have a deep connection with religion, magic, and the devil. This book, The Sworn Book of Honorius, is said to be the oldest medieval grimoire to date, with some people estimating that it was written back in the 1300s. Even though Honorius of Thebes was said to have written this book, it's said to be a collection of many magicians who attempted to condense the knowledge that they had into 93 chapters. The book covers a wide array of magical topics. This includes having the ability to travel to purgatory, or to potentially save someone from purgatory, or even send them there in the first place. It shows people the rituals necessary to summon a demon and bring them into our real physical world. Then once that demon is there, the book goes on to describe how we can command a demon to do our bidding. It shows people how to send someone to hell or to heaven if that person chooses. It even goes in depth about treasure hunting and the proper methods to finding treasure. This book was supposed to act as a one stop shop on how to be a full magician. A big warning though and why you need to pray before reading is actually written in the book. Let him who would work in a magical art beware that he not be in deadly sin, for if he be, he shall be mad ever after. For the soul by its nature desires to see God in whom it delights, but the impediment of sin frustrates its desire and it cannot see God. He who would work in magical art must be willing in his work and utterly cleansed from all filthiness, for the more he suffers, the more he shall obtain. Basically, if you intend to use this book, then you can expect your soul to go through some serious suffering. Number 4 on this list is the Dragon Rouge. The Dragon Rouge is an updated version of one of the most haunted texts in history, the Grand Grimoire. Keegan actually covered the Grand Grimoire in one of his previous parts of this series, so I highly recommend you go check out one of those videos if you haven't already. But the Coles notes are that the Grand Grimoire was a text that described how to make a deal with the devil. It showed the reader how to summon Lucifer, and then how to make a pact with him once he is summoned. The Dragon Rouge is a version of this Grand Grimoire that goes further into detail on several demons and how one should summon them. What's interesting about this text is that it inspired the name for a cult group in the 90s called the Dragon Rouge. This cult was founded by Thomas Carlson, a Swedish man in 1989. Thomas claimed that he had visions growing up as a child and believed to be connected to spirits and God somehow. This cult is based in the left hand path of magic, which for those who don't know, is considered to be the dark magic and associated with the workings of the devil. Apparently the Dragon Rouge text text is one that is worshipped and used quite often during the proceedings of this cult. If you wanted to, you could actually visit the Dragon Rouge's website and volunteer to join their cult, but based on the writings of the book that they worship, 
I personally wouldn't recommend it. Number three on this list is the Book of Shadows. The name alone, the Book of Shadows, is enough to make someone believe that this text is haunted, but its origins confirm that suspicion even more. Gerald Gardner was a Wiccan living in the 1940s. Now, if you aren't familiar with what a Wiccan is, then it's actually someone who practices the religion of Wicca, which is a modern pagan religion. Gerald Gardner created the Book of Shadows, or was at least the person who brought it to people's attention. He's also known as the father of Wicca, and it's considered by most to be the one who started this religion. Religion. He may not have actually been the one to have written the book though because he says that he received this ancient text from a secret coven of witches. Owen Davies, an expert on haunted books, says that this book was one of the last of a line of worshippers of an ancient fertility religion, which he and his followers believed had survived centuries of persecution by Christian authorities. This obviously made this text extremely valuable to Gerald, and he used it as a means to gain more of a following for his religion. Inside this book are magical rituals, spells, enchantments, and a variety of instructions for how to perform other sacred summonings. This book is said to be extremely dark in nature, and certainly something that you would want to pray before reading. Gerald apparently used many of these spells spells and rituals through his life as he praised witchcraft. Others who have read this book have reported feeling extremely cold and getting the sensation of being watched. Any book that you apparently receive from a coven of witches has spells on how to worship them, and it's called the Book of Shadows. It certainly can't be any good. Number two on this list is The Great Omar. The Great Omar is one of the prettiest and ornate books that you will ever see in your life. Back in the day, book binding, the process of assembling a book and putting it together, was considered by most to be an art form. This book really proves that, having taken 2,500 hours to create, and using emeralds, rubies, and sapphires in its creation, it really was a marvel. The text in this book contained a bunch of four-line poems by Omar Khayyam. These poems were apparently filled with temptation and condemned by the church because of that. That being said though, after the book was constructed, Sangorsky, the man who designed the book, wanted to sell it at an exorbitant price. Problem was, not many people wanted a book that would cost them thousands of pounds. This book traveled by ship back and forth from Europe and America several times with no apparent buyer in sight. This continued until it's made its way onto a very famous ship called the Titanic. Obviously, the Titanic did not reach its destination, and the Great Omar sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, where it rests to this day. However, what gives this book the designation of being haunted is that only a week or two later, Sangorsky himself died. He died from drowning, just like the people on the Titanic would have died. Ever since this has happened, people believe that the Great Omar was actually cursed, and that it could have potentially been the cause of the Titanic's demise and the death of Sangorsky. It could all be one big coincidence, but I don't recommend reading The Great Omar 2, which was published by Sangorsky's partner later in life, because some evil may just befall you. Number one on this list is The Lesser Key of Solomon. The Lesser Key of Solomon is a book that came after one of the oldest grimoires to ever exist, which is The Key of Solomon. Now, The Key of Solomon was estimated to have been written in the 15th century, whereas the book that we're looking at right now, The Lesser Key of Solomon, was said to have been written two centuries later. The first book talks a lot about the power of God and utilizing that power for personal gain. Typically, this was done through extensive worship of God and various ceremonies that praised his power. The Lesser Key of Solomon, though, takes a far different approach. This book expanded on those principles, but mainly dove into demonology. Its pages studied the hierarchy of demons and the beliefs surrounding demons. As many of you are probably expecting, though, it didn't just stop there at an intellectual study. The Lesser Key of Solomon went far deeper and described the process in summoning demons and traveling to the demon world. Its pages show a much greater greater appreciation to Satan and discuss the great power that can be obtained from worshipping demons and the devil. It goes into detail on how to craft potions that you can give to other people that will then put them under your spell. This book is also said to be heavily cursed. It is reported that if you own this book, you are susceptible to demonic possession. Previous owners have reported strange ongoings such as pages turning on their own, other books flying off of the shelf, and dark creatures appearing in their home. Therefore, owning this book is said to be extremely risky, and even though you might get a glimpse into how to navigate the underworld, you could become a victim to one of those very demons that you're trying to summon. In number five, we have Shams al Maharif. Shams al Ma'arif, or Shams al Ma'arif, wa la ta'if a awalrif, is a 13th century grimoire centered on Arabic magic and claimed to be a manual for achieving esoteric spirituality. I apologize from the bottom of my heart if I butchered that pronunciation in any way. I promise I did practice. It was written by the scholar Ahmed al Buni, who wrote it while living in Algeria, and he passed around 1225 Common Era. 
The book is a patchwork of bits and pieces of Al Buni's authentic works and texts by other authors. Scholars like Ibnin Tamiya have criticized the book and labeled Al Buni as a deluded devil worshipper. Ah, uh, good to know that across all religions over time, some things never change. In terms of more modern examples, that was a common assumption from Ed and Lorraine Warren, probably the most famed demonologist of all time. Personally, I believe half of what they investigated was real, and the other half was just them making a living. Which, at the end of the day, I have to give some respect to. Well, minus viewing alternate lifestyles outside of Christianity as a sin. Pardon me, I got a little sidetracked there. In contemporary form, the book consists of two volumes, the Shams al Ma'arif al Kubra and the Shams al Ma'arif al Sugra, with the former being the larger of the two. The first few chapters introduce the reader to magic squares, and the combination of numbers and the alphabet that are believed to bring magical effect, which the author claims is the only way to communicate with jinn, angels, and spirits. The table of contents that were introduced in the later printed editions of the work contained a list of unnumbered chapters, which stretched to a number of 40. However, However, prior to the printing press and various other standardizations, there were three independent volumes that circulated, each one differing in length. While being popular, it also carries a notorious reputation for being suppressed and banned for much of Islamic history, ergo how it found its way to our list today. However, it continues to persist in being read and studied up to the present day, despite its questionable veracity and negative implications. Some Sufi orders, such as the Naqshbandi Haqqani order, have recognized its legitimacy and use as a compendium for the cult and hold it in high regard. Another title by the same author, the title having been translated to the source of Essentials of Wisdom, is considered its companion text. In terms of translations, although a formal translation into English has not happened yet, there have been numerous renditions of a few of the more popular rituals found within the main treaties, as well as those that lie in its accompanying text. In number four, we have the Grand Grimoire. It's a black magic grimoire, and for reference, a grimoire is a textbook of magic that typically, you know, includes instructions on how to create magical objects like talismans and amulets, how to perform magical spells, charms, and divination, and how to summon or invoke supernatural entities such as angels, spirits, deities, and demons. In many cases, the books themselves are believed to be imbued with magical powers, although in many cultures, other sacred texts that are not grimoires, such as the Bible, have been believed to have supernatural properties intrinsically. The only contents found in a grimoire would be information on spells, rituals, the preparation of magical tools, and lists of ingredients and their magical correspondences. In this manner, while all books on magic could be thought of as grimoires, not all magical books should be thought of as grimoires. Different editions date the specific one back to 1521, 1522, or 1421, but it was probably written during the early 19th century. Some experts suggest that 1702 is when the first edition may have been created, and a Bibliothèque Bleue version, similar to a chapter book, of the text may have been published in 1750. The introductory chapter was authored by Antonia Veneciana del Rabina, who gathered his information from the original writings of King Solomon. Much of the material of this grimoire derives from the Key of Solomon and Lesser Key of Solomon, which are grimoires attributed to King Solomon. How'd you know? Also known as Le Dragon Rouge, or the Red Dragon, this book contains instructions on how to summon Lucifer, or Lucifège Rofocal, for the purpose of forming a deal with the devil. The 19th century French occultist Eflifaz Lévy, author of Dogme et Rituel de la Haute Magie, claimed the contemporary edition of Le Dragon Rouge was a counterfeit of a true older Grand Grimoire. And I love petty historical spats. <laughs> the overall work is divided into two books. The first book contains instructions for summoning a demon, and the construction of of tools with which to force a demon to do one's bidding. The second book is divided into, you know, two further parts. The Sanctum Regnum and Secrets, de l'or magique du Grand Grimoire. The Sanctum Regnum contains instructions for making a pact with the demon, allowing one to command the spirit without the tools required by book one, but at greater risk. Secrets contain simple spells and rituals one can employ after having performed the ritual of the first book. Some editions contain a short text between these two parts, known as Le Secret Magique ou Le Grand Art de Pouvoir Parler aux Morts, or in English, The Magic Secret or The Grand Art of Being Able to, you know, Speak with the Dead, which deals with necromancy. The book describes several demons as well as the rituals to summon them in order to make a pact with them. It also details several spells for winning a lottery, talking to spirits, being loved by a girl, making oneself invisible, and more. This book's mentions three greater demons, which are similarly prioritized in the Grimorium Verum. Sidebar, in the English translation of the work, the demons are referenced by the more generic term of spirits, which is a term I know some modern Satanists refer. The demons that are mentioned are the Emperor Lucifer, Prince Beelzebub, and the Grand Duke Astaroth. Now this work also makes mention of six lesser demons, 
And of course I'll mention them all. Lucy Fejois Foucault, Prime Minister, Saint Nachia, Commander in Chief, Aglia Rept, Commandant, Fleurti, Lieutenant General, Sargatanas, Brigadier Major, Nebiros, Marshal and Inspector General. In number three we have The Orphan Story. Written in the early 1600s by Martin de Leon Cardenas, The Orphan Story is a novel about a 14 year old Spaniard who heads to the Americas in search of, you know, fortune. While it may sound like a normal adventure story and an outlier amongst the magic books today, a major darkness lurks within its pages that led to the novel not being published until 2018. The first draft was a 328 page manuscript, slightly yellowed, you know, slightly more than aged, and missing a couple of pages. It is handwritten in a decorative style reflective of the golden or imperial age. The new age print takes on a more modern bound look, featuring artwork from the original manuscript on the front, yet a rather plain book from that, you know, the past. Belinda Palacios, a Peruvian scholar who edited the book for two years, says that she was warned by multiple people about the orphan story. It was first set to appear in 1621 under the pen name of Andres de Leon, but never made it to the press due to the presidential atmosphere at the time in Sicily. The manuscript then sat in the Hispanic Society of America until 1965 when Belinda rediscovered it. She learned that many attempts to publish the orphan story had happened, giving rise to rumors that malevolent energy lurked among the almost 400 pages, causing the people working on it to die. In an interview she commented on the reported deaths, saying one was from a strange disease, another in a car accident, and yet another a something else. Belinda had also heard from other professors she was working with to publish the book, one specialized in colonial letters from the Andean regions in Mexico, who was named Raquel Chang Rodriguez. So her, those letters described how Antonio Rodriguez Monino and William C. Bryant both died before finishing their editions of the book, and is why the manuscript is believed to be cursed or bewitched. They told her that the book was cursed, and the reason it had taken so long to publish was that anyone who worked on it would die in mysterious ways. Did the powers that be not want the ancient script out in the world? Note to self, don't go within 10 feet of the book. Not worth it. In second place, we have the book of Abramelin the Mage. Most folks, you know, today would be happy with a gift card or dinner for their birthday, but Abramelin the Mage decided to give his son a book full of mythical curses. It's definitely a unique gift. So this book tells the story of an Egyptian mage named Abraham, or Abramelin, who taught a system of magic to Abraham of Worms, a Jew in Worms, Germany. The system of magic from this book regained popularity in the 19th and 20th centuries, partly due to Samuel Liddell, McGregor Mather's translation, which dubbed it the Book of Sacred Magic of Abramelin the Mage. Ever since it was translated to English, this 15th century novel has had a reputation for being cursed. Now there are several theories why, but most believe it has to do with the mage's belief that everybody has their own unique personal demon. Throughout the book, there are instructions for rituals and supernatural feats to bring your demons under control. Anyone with any sense knows that it's risky to reach out and communicate with the spirit world, so it's not surprising that readers of this book have reported bad luck and hauntings by spirits from another realm. The grimoire is framed as a sort of epistolary novel, or autobiography, in which Abraham of Worms describes his journey from Germany to Egypt and reveals Abramelin's magical and capitalistic secrets to his son Lamech. Internally, the text dates itself to the year 1458. The story involves Abraham passing his magical and capitalistic secrets onto his son and tells, you know, how he acquired his knowledge. Abraham recounts how he found Abram the mage living in the desert outside of an Egyptian town, Iraqi or Iraqi, which borders the Nile. Abram's home sat atop a small hill surrounded by trees. He was an Egyptian mage and taught a powerful form of Kabbalistic magic to Abraham. He was a, you know, venerably aged man, very courteous and kind, discussing only the fear of God, the importance of leading a well-regulated life, and the evils of the acquisition of riches and goods. You know, the usual fare. Abraham alone extracted a promise from Abraham that he would give up his false dogmas and live in the way and law of the Lord. He then gave Abraham two manuscript books to copy for himself, asking for 10 gold florins, which he took with the intention of distributing to 72 poor persons in Iraqi. Upon his return 15 days later, after having disposed of the payment money, Abraham alone extracted an oath from Abraham to serve and fear the Lord, and to live and die in his most holy law. After this, Abraham was given the divine science and true magic embedded with the two manuscripts, which he was to follow and give to only those whom he knew well. The book exists in the form of 12 manuscripts and an early printed edition. The early manuscripts are two versions that date from around 1608, are written in German, while another two manuscripts date from about 1700 and 1750 respectively. The practical magic found in both book 3 of the French text and book 4 of the German original centers around a set of talismans composed of magical word squares. These are similar to traditional magic squares, though the latter are usually composed of numbers, while Abramelin's squares contain letters. Commonly word squares are used as puzzles or as teaching aids for students. In this context though, the focus becomes mystical so that each square should contain words or names that relate to the magical goal of the square. A parallel is found in the famous Satyor Arepo Tenet opera Rotos Word Square, an altered version of which is also found among Abraham's squares. Curse book and math puzzles? 
Yeah, no thanks. In first place, we have Untitled Grimoires. I feel like that should be scary enough on its own, but time to elaborate. These manuscripts were believed to be written in the early 1900s, as their first library appearance was around in the 1920s. The books originated when a Wiccan high priestess called Persephone Adrastea Irene recorded her family's spiritual history of being an American witch of Swedish and English ancestry. These manuscripts record Persephone's witchy history that she reworked all through her adult life, incorporating her mother's grimoire into them as well. The first book contains around 250 pages of spells, incantations, curses, and enchantments, as well as corresponding information on gems, planets, rites, potions, and even exorcisms. The second book includes around 150 to 200 pages of alchemy and chemistry recipes, cures, perfumes and balms, nerve tonics, and even hairspray recipes. The first book is believed to carry the curse heavier than its counterpart, as Persephone's spells are believed in Wiccan culture to contain more power than most other records due to the embodiment of herself within them. Originally, the books belonged to Alice Montserrat, the wife of Israel Rigardi, who moved to the UK in the 1920s to work with famous occult writer Aleister Crawley. Later on, they both went on to work with the Golden Dawn Order and printed their works and publications as occultism raised into the modern world. Although Montserrat did little reporting on the cursed lore over these books, she did make notes as to why she and others within the Order believed the curse carried some serious weight. She made a note to an inscription warning all those who read it, saying, To those not of the craft, the reading of this book is forbidden. Proceed no further, or justice will exact a swift and terrible retribution, and you will surely suffer at the hand of the craft. This was written in not only English, but other languages as well, to ensure the reader be heavily warned to, uh, keep away. To this day, copies of the Untitled Grimoires can be bought from M. Benjamin Katz Fine Books. They still come with a high warning for all non-believers, within Wiccan or Pagan beliefs, to shy away from them because of the cursed lore within and surrounding their pages. As tempting as it might be to acquire a copy, since that is a place I could technically travel to, I don't want to risk fate. My life's crazy enough. Number five on this list is the Sacred Book of Abramelin the Mage. This book was written by, and yep, you guys guessed it, Abramelin. Abramelin held a belief that every single person had their own unique personal demon within them. Kind of sounds like the guy who's been through a few rough breakups if you ask me. He believed, though, that even though we all had this personal demon, that it could be tamed and it could be controlled. Sort of like this inner power that you have that once you're capable of controlling, it will be very, very strong. If you have this inner demon tamed, then you'll be able to perform supernatural feats and abilities that the average human won't be able to do. That's basically what this book is all about. Taming your inner demon and learning to work with it so that you can harness that power. Then, once you've done so, this book will teach you what sort of powers you're able to perform. Now, this all sounds pretty legendary, actually. I think that everybody would love to be able to channel some magical part of themselves and perform supernatural feats. The book, as with many on this list, though, comes with a downside. If you have this book in your possession, then you're said to be haunted by spirits from another dimension. And these spirits will bring you horrible luck. Maybe if you channel your inner demon quick enough and then get rid of this book, it could be worth it, but something tells me that it's going to take longer than an afternoon to do that, which probably makes this book too dangerous to use. Number four on this list is the Arabetal. The Arabetal, or the Arabetal de Magia Veretum, is an ancient text that has some questionable things in it. Although the intentions of this book are good, and it may have helped some individuals live a better life, there are dark things in here as well, and the better life can't be said for all people who use this book. Ancient Origins writes, The Arabetal is a Renaissance period grimoire and one of the most influential works of its kind. Unlike some other occult manuscripts that contain dark magic and malicious spells, the Arabetal contains spiritual advice and guidance on how to live an honest and honorable life. The Arabetal is said to have been written in 1575 AD. The author remains unknown, although it's been speculated that it was written by a man named Jacques Gohori. The focus of the Arabetal is on nature and the natural relationships between humanity and a celestial hierarchy. It centers on the positive relationships between the celestial world and humans, and the interaction between the two of them. The Arabetal was an extremely influential work for its time. So as we can see, this ancient text isn't inherently evil in nature, or at least that wasn't its initial intention. However, this book has been connected to some urban legends, and one copy of the text in particular is definitely cursed. It's believed that back in the 1600s, this book fell into the property of a young Polish farmer. The farmer grew obsessed with this book and the dark and malicious spells that it contained. 
he cursed his rivals and made it so that their crops would never grow. He turned into this evil warlock who the whole region feared. Even though they feared him, they weren't going to give up all hope. The people rose up and attacked this warlock farmer. They killed him, but before he died, he cursed his copy of the Arabetal so that whoever reads it will die within 60 days. Needless to say, the people weren't about to test this guy's curse out, and they hid the copy of the book away. Nowadays, nobody knows where it went, and it could still possibly be out there. So if you do ever pick up one of these texts and give it a read, then you're basically rolling the dice and just hoping that it wasn't that same copy that got cursed. Number three on this list is the Book of Soiga. The Book of Soiga is one of the most intriguing books on this list. Humans like things that are hard to come by, things that are rare and often valuable to us. Diamonds are beautiful, but it's actually the rarity and difficulty in finding the diamonds that make them as valuable as they are. Well, the Book of Soiga took a book from those precious stones, and it's definitely hard to come by. The style inspiration says, dating back to the 16th century, the Book of Soiga, also known as the Aldaria, is a Latin essay about demonology with only two known copies in existence. One was owned by the scholar John Dee and his elder brother devoted his entire life to decoding the Book of Soiga. Though he successfully determined that the book was full of dark rituals and incantations, he struggled to figure out the final 36 pages. His obsession with figuring out the content of those final pages drove Dee to insanity. Obsessed, he even hired a medium to summon the Archangel Uriel to help with the translation. Speaking through Dee's medium, Uriel apparently explains that the book came into existence when Adam ended paradise and that it could only be interpreted by Archangel Michael. After Dee's death, the book was thought long lost until two copies were found in 1994. Since then, many have been tempted to try and complete these works, but it comes with a serious risk. According to legend, anyone who successfully deciphers those final pages is destined to die in under three years. So, dying in three years obviously isn't the best, but the good part about this is because it's so rare, it's pretty unlikely to stumble on this book and give it a read. This is like a legendary Pokemon of cursed books though, so if you do ever come across it, don't read it, but definitely scoop it up and put that thing on eBay. In that case, the Book of Soiga might actually be a blessing. Number two on this list is The Lesser Key of Solomon. This book is so cursed that it doesn't even need to be read to curse you. Literally just being in its proximity can do the trick. Slapped Ham writes, The Lesser Key of Solomon, also known as the Clavica Solomon's Regis, is a cursed grimoire of demonology. Its original authors are unknown and it's said to be comprised of texts compiled sometime in the 17th century. The book contains passages on how to conjure spirits of the dead and demons and how to control these entities to do your bidding. Curses and invocations also play a large role in the ancient text. Esoteric topics like how to become invisible and locate missing or stolen items are covered. Recipes for love potions and liquors of persuasion are also scattered throughout the book. This definitely isn't the book you want to own. It's reportedly so cursed that it will doom anyone who keeps a copy on their bookshelf. Those who've owned it have reported strange occurrences like pages turning on their own and books violently flying across the room. Strange whispers and shadow creatures have also been reported by owners of the manual. Owning the Lesser Key of Solomon is also believed to bring about catastrophic bad luck. It's said that the only way to break the book's curse is to burn the pages and properly dispose of the ashes. Finally, someone making some sense. How many times have I gone on this channel and talked about how we just need to start burning things? Cursed books. Cursed houses, cursed objects, screw all of it, let's just burn it. At the end of the day, this stuff is really cool, but I'm not out here trying to have my life ruined by some weird book. Burn it hot and let's be done with it. And finally, number one on this list is the Codex Gigas. Codex Gigas is one of the closest things that we have to a Bible for the devil. And anything that carries a weight to it like that needs to be on this list. The style inspiration says, At 92 centimeters, the Codex Gigas is the largest extant medieval illuminated manuscript in the world. Just like everything evil, it comes with two names and the Codex Gigas second name is more than a little foreboding. The Devil's Bible. The history of the book is heavy to say the least. 
It was written by a monk who had broken his spiritual vows, and for his crime, the monk was sentenced to die entombed behind a brick wall. The night before his death, the monk began chronicling everything he knew about the human experience in a book. So, the story goes, realizing he wouldn't have time to finish it. He apparently summoned Lucifer and asked him to complete the project in exchange for his soul. The book was then allegedly completed by the devil himself. It's overflowing with dark rituals and imagery and even includes 19-inch drawings of the devil and other demonic entities. Now, obviously, because this was written by the devil, there are some side effects from reading the thing. People have reported watching their friends become possessed as they read it. Now, it's currently on display for people to go take a look at the National Library of Sweden. But be very careful if you ever do go take a look, because clearly, this is the work of the devil. Number five on this list is the Untitled Grimoires. The Untitled Grimoires were written by a witch, and really not the type of book that you want to be reading before bedtime or actually reading it all for that matter. Digital Trend says, The Untitled Grimoires is a set of two handwritten spiral-bound spell books sold by an online retailer for nearly $14,000 back in 2013. The books were handwritten in the 1960s by Persephone Adrasta Iorin, a high priestess of Wicca who supposedly led her own coven. All 250 pages are filled with incantations, spells, enchantments, and details on how to summon spirits and demons. However, there was a serious catch. The seller warned buyers that any non-believers who messed with the books would bring a deadly curse upon themselves, while Persephone herself explicitly tells readers on the first page that proceeding with the book would have serious consequences. She wrote, To those not of the craft, the reading of this book is forbidden. Proceed no further, or justice will exact a swift and terrible retribution, and you will surely suffer at the hand of the craft. So, literally anyone who can't perform dark magic already, can't read this book and learn how to perform dark magic without dark magic coming and cursing them. Seems like a kind of a stupid way to get people to join your club, but I guess I'm not familiar with the ongoings of witches. Either way, there is no doubt that this book is deeply cursed. I can't imagine spending 14 grand on this thing, unless you literally were already familiar with dark magic yourself, and I guess then you could make use of the book, but that's not me. People who have tried to read this thing have had some horrible tragedies befall them, so I highly do not recommend it. Number four on this list is Pseudodomarchia de Mona. Wow, okay, that was an absolute freaking mouthful, so I'm not gonna be calling it that anymore because it's also called the False Hierarchy of Demons, and I'm gonna be saying that from here on out. Ancient Origins says, This is a great compendium from the 16th century dictating the names of 69 demons. The list initially appeared as an appendix to a book about demonology and witchcraft by Johann Weyer. The son of a civic service merchant, Johann Weyer, was a Dutch doctor and occult practitioner born in the Netherlands in 1515. Well versed in Latin from a young age, Weyer quickly became a student of Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, a famous magician, theologian, and occultist in Antwerp. It appears that Weir's fascination with magic began while working under Agapipa, but later escalated after he became a doctor in his own right. He was summoned to a particular fortune teller's court case and thereby asked by the judge for advice on the topic. The court case started his interest in researching the witchcraft way of life, culminating with his decision to attempt to defend those who were accused of practicing. 27 years after this case, when Weyer was 62 years old, he published The False Hierarchy of Demons. This book, as with most that study demons, also talks about how to summon and control these demons. This book also focuses a lot on witchcraft too, something that became a deep obsession for Weyer. Definitely a book that you should avoid, and one that could hold some serious curses. Number three on this list is the Ars Notoria. The Ars Notoria is an ancient text which grants the person who studies it a perfect memory. Something that sounds great from the outside, but it isn't as cool as it's cracked up to be. Ancient Origins writes, As part of a larger collection known as the Lesser Keys of Solomon, the Ars Notoria is a book that is said to allow followers a mastery of academia, giving them greater eloquence, a perfect memory, and wisdom. The Ars Notoria is one of five books within the Lesser Keys of Solomon, an anonymous text that was compiled from other works in the 17th century and focuses on demonology. The Ars Notoria is the oldest portion of the Lesser of the Keys Grimoire, dating back to the 13th century. 
However, the texts contained within are a collection of orations, prayers, and magical words which date back to well before the 1200s. The prayers are in several languages including Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. It was not a book of spells or potions, but a book of prayers and orations that are said to strengthen and focus one's mental powers by beseeching God for intellectual gifts. Among these intellectual gifts is the concept of a perfect memory. Those, those who practice liberal arts such as arithmetic, geometry, and philosophy are promised a mastery of their subject if they devote themselves to the Ars Notoria. Within, it describes a daily process of visualization, contemplation, and orations intended to enhance the practitioner's focus and memory. So here's the thing guys, that all sounds well and good and, and very useful, but I don't think that people understand what a perfect memory actually means. It means that there is literally nothing at any given point that you will ever forget. The license plate of that one car that cut you off. That one passing comment that the cashier said about the milk that you bought. The strange handshake that you had with your friend the other day. Literally nothing at all. You're not going to forget anything. Think about how much noise is going to be going on in your head at one given time if you can't forget anything. This is the curse of this book and it's why a lot of people who have studied it in depth have lost their minds. If you're going to remember everything in the world then there also needs to be a way to turn it off every now and again. To finally get some silence in your head. Sometimes forgetting things really is the best thing for us. Number 2 on this list is The Picatrix. The Picatrix is definitely a book that should be avoided and it's mainly for how freaking grotesque it is. It was initially written in Arabic back in the 11th century and it's a book that's centered around astrology and magic. It teaches the individuals who study it how to concoct crazy spells and make magical potions. What has thrust it into the limelight, as I mentioned earlier, is how freaking gross it is. The magical potions and the spells in here are just disgusting and they're honestly plain wrong. Various body parts, various fluid from said body parts and other weird stuff is regularly called upon in this text. The following is a literal passage from the book on how to make a spell. Take 4 ounces of the blood of a black dog, 2 ounces each of pig's blood and brains, and 1 ounce of donkey brains. Mix all of this together until well blended. When you give this medicine to someone in food or drink, he will hate you. And like, yeah, duh, if anyone blended up a bunch of brains and then gave it to me to drink, then I would kind of hate them as well. Many people think that this book is cursed based on the horrible spells in it, but it honestly might not be and could just be super weird. Either way, probably best to be avoided. And number one on this list is the Voynich Manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript is an illustrated codex that is handwritten in a writing system or language that no one understands. By using some advanced carbon dating, we can determine that it was made back in the early 15th century. We're pretty sure that based on the style of writing, artwork, and language that's in this book, it was most likely made in Italy. The manuscript contains 240 pages in it, and even though it was discovered a long time ago, no one has any idea what it truly means. This could be a good thing though, because the current prevailing wisdom is that whoever discovered exactly what this book says and means, they're going to be cursed. Some think that this book has an ancient alien curse that's attached to it and that it was dumped in Italy hundreds of years ago by said extraterrestrials. Others believe that there were some deep devil worshippers who made this book after finally making contact with the devil. Either way, so far we have no idea what it says and if things maintain how they've been, we probably won't ever know. Which for a book like the Voynich Manuscript? might actually be for the best. Kicking off at number 5, the Munich Manual of Demonic Magic. A text supposedly written sometime in the 15th century, the Munich Manual of Demonic Magic is a grimoire manuscript that describes the lost ancient rites of demonic knowledge. It is claimed that this text has been largely ignored by scholars throughout history due to its malevolent nature. The text which is solely composed in Latin is pretty much a handbook to demonology and much more worryingly appears to be a handbook guide to necromancy. Although it was my favourite class in Diablo 2, Fishymancer, if you know, you know. The text was later picked up and an edited manuscript was published in 1998 by Richard Kikofer, an American medievalist and religious historian, where it was renamed Forbidden Rites and Necromancer's Manual of the 15th century. Stranger still though, a vast portion of this book has yet to be fully translated, so 
Who knows what the hell is lurking deep within its message. Coming in at number four, Picatrix, which is a word that I just love saying. Picatrix. Almost sounds cute, right? Well, unfortunately, it's pretty far from that. It has been summarized as the most thorough exposition of celestial magic in Arabic. In actual fact, though, Picatrix is a 400 page book of magic and astrology, originally written in Arabic under the title Gayat al Hakim, allegedly dated all the way back to the 11th century. Although some scholars have argued that it was in actual fact written in the first half of the 10th century. Gayat al Hakim loosely translates to the aim of the sage or the goal of the wise. It wasn't until 1256 when it was translated into Spanish by Alfonso the 10th of Castile and later into Latin where it picked up the name Picatrix. The book synthesizes ancient works of magic with astrology and outlines a practice known as talismanic magic, a celestial power that allegedly draws on the cosmic will of the universe. It also draws on the neoplatic theory of hypostasis, which essentially is the idea that there's always a bigger fish and it may or may not be a demon. Next up at number three, the Grand Grimoire. A text so nefarious and mysterious that most people believe that it's kept deep in the bowels of the Vatican Church's ancient vaulted archives, which, sadly for us, isn't open to the public. While there is no evidence for this, the Grand Grimoire has nevertheless gained notoriety throughout the modern era, with its legend being popularized in the early 20th century. Plain and simple, this grimoire outlines black magic, with different editions dating the book between 1521, 1522, and 1421, respectively, although the most likely versions were written in the early 19th century. The Grand Grimoire is also known as Le Dragon Rouge or the Red Dragon and is later divided into two sections. The Sanctum Regnum which outlines the instructions for making a pact with a demon and commanding the spirit through the means of a blasting rod into doing the readers bidding including instructions to make a pact with the devil. The second part is known as Le Secret Magique ou Le Grand Art de Poivre Parler ou More which is the secret magic or the grand art of being able to speak with the dead, which I think is pretty self explanatory. <laughs> Swinging it at number two, the Swarm Book of Honorius. And this is perhaps one of the oldest existing medieval grimoires that can actually be verified in its entirety. It's important to note that this grimoire shouldn't be confused with the grimoire of Pope Honorius because this one is an entirely different story. Written by Honorius of Thebes, a mysterious historical figure shrouded in the occult, this grimoire is pretty much a play by play guide on how to conjure and command demons and allegedly contact a divine celestial power. It outlines the use of seals, an operation outlined in the Key of Solomon, which may or not be on this list. The first medieval reference of this text was in 1347. It appears numerous times throughout history in 1456 and frequently throughout the 14th and 15th century. Allegedly, the Swarm Book of Honorius is a product of a conference of magicians who thought it would be a grand old idea to stick their heads together and condense all that vast mystical knowledge into one single volume. Well, that volume just so happened to be a staggering 93 chapters of demonic, all powerful, mystical know how. That's some pretty heavy reading. And finally, our number one spot the magical treatise of Solomon and the primary means that we even understand the term demon. The magical treatise of Solomon is some mystical, funky stuff shrouded in the mystery of an ancient world. Well, the Byzantine Empire to be specific. Also known by its more lofty name, the little key of the whole art of hygromancy found by several craftsmen and by the holy prophet Solomon. Which, you know, if you're going to name something, you may as well name it in full. This grimoire is literally the cornerstone of every grimoire ever made and serves as the bridge between the Roman era Testament of Solomon and the Renaissance Key of Solomon, where the mystical era of demonology made its return. Allegedly, it was based upon the found scripture of King Solomon, laying out his knowledge to his son Rehoboam, and it is pretty much a guidebook on a vast amount of magical techniques and tools to summon and control a host of demonic spirits, create charms, understand the differing means of divination and heal through the powerful use of herbalism. Whatever your thoughts, there's no doubt that the magical treatise of Solomon had a massive influence on everything from folklore and witchcraft to horror cinema, 
and even Harry Potter and whatever it is, it makes for a bloody interesting story. In at number five, we have Tomino's Hell. Okay, so this one is a poem rather than a full book, but it still holds an ancient curse that it is worth sending a warning about. It was written by Japanese writer Seijo Yasso. Not much is known about the writer. He published the poem in 1919 in his 27th collection of poetry. Seijo lost his sister and his father during World War One. It is said since that happened, he was in a constant state of suffering and grief. Since the poem gained its reputation for the curse, many have given their opinion how the book became such a danger. Many believe that Seijo was vulnerable to demons while he was in his suffering state, that he might have been persuaded to do their bidding to ease his pain. He allowed them to curse the poem in such a way that when it was read out loud, it would cause those who heard it to suffer. It is unknown if Seijo was aware of the consequences of his actions when he published the work. The work itself seems to almost confirm this as it follows a young boy who has suffered loss in his descent into hell. When the poem was released, there quickly came reports of sudden passings. One woman is said to have died moments after reading the poem out loud. Others have complained of chest pains, sharp pains in their brain, along with many other severe symptoms. Many people got sick and others passed away suddenly from illness or bizarre accidents. The one passing that was most famous was that of Japanese filmmaker Tarayama Shuji. Shuji made a film based on the poem in 1974. The film was believed to have been cursed by the poem when Shuji passed away suddenly shortly after it was released. The book has since become a terrifying legend and those who know of it try to avoid it at all costs. In 2004, the writer Inu Haiko published a book based on the poem. This brought the poem to a new audience. Since then, more people have found the poem online to test if the rumors are true. Those people reported weird occurrences and horrific accidents after they read it. In at number four, the book of the sacred magic of Abraham Mellon, the mage. The book of the sacred magic of Abraham Mellon, the mage, is a book of mystic arts written by Abraham for his son Lamech. It was a three part 15th century book. It was translated in the 1900s. Once translated, it developed a reputation for being cursed. Abraham wrote his book based on the idea that every person has their own unique personal demon. The book contains rituals to help the reader summon and control their demon. It is told that once you could do this, you could perform supernatural feats. It is said that if you own this book, you will also get the attached curse. Anyone with a copy in their possession will be haunted by spirits from another realm. People unlucky enough to own the book have had bad luck follow them and some even met an early demise. It is said that the incantations that give you the ability to control your demon releases the curse and opens you up to demons from the other side. Fun stuff. In at number three, we have The Great Omar. Some call The Great Omar the most cursed book of all time. Unlike other books in this list that might unleash a curse on the person or people who open it, the curse is often contained. This book, however, has been linked to many great tragedies throughout history. People were captured by the beauty of this book. The beauty of the binding hid the curse from the world and enchanted buyers. The book was embellished with over 1,000 jewels, with 5,000 leathers on lays and 100 square feet of gold leaf. It took the team of craftsmen over two and a half years to make. Only one was ever made due to the grandeur of the book. When the book was finally completed, it was sold at auction for £1,000 and shipped to New York for display. The book went down on the Titanic and was destroyed. Some say it was due to the book being on board that the ship went down when further misfortunes followed anyone involved. The creator of the book drowned while trying to rescue a woman a few weeks later. His partner decided to recreate the book. Again, this was a long and painful task, costing him a lot of time. Time. Once the second book was created, it was placed in a vault in London. He wanted it to be reserved so that it would not meet the same fate as the first. Unfortunately, the vault and the second creator were both destroyed in the bombings of World War II. Was this a coincidence that both books and creators were destroyed? Some think that an ancient curse latched onto the book on creation. This then passed to the second on creation. Was it due to the story inside? Little is written on the book. People only ever paid attention to the cover. This may have been by design. The company that created the books then passed on to one of the previous owner's nephews. After his retirement, he decided to do a personal project and recreate the book. This copy lives in the British Library to this day. I would not risk attempting to touch or read it though. His past seems like a clear warning. In at number two, we have The Grand Grimoire. The Grand Grimoire is also nicknamed The Gospel of Satan. It is an occult book written by a man in the 15th century. Little is known about the man who wrote the book, but he is believed to have been possessed by the devil. On completion of the book, the devil passed from him into the book. 
book. The book is known to be cursed by the devil. You're advised to not attempt to read this book. A grimoire is a book of spells. The particular spells in the book are dark and twisted. Often some form of sacrifice is needed to complete any of the spells. You would need to be willing to perform some truly evil acts if you wanted to be successful with these spells. A lot of people look for this book due to its promise to be able to bring loved ones back to life or summon demons. Many people who are grieving loved ones who pass too soon try to use this book to bring them back. This is extremely dangerous and not only will it may not work but it might backfire and cause your own demise. This book has such a dark reputation it has been the most feared book since medieval times. Of course it goes without saying that you should avoid this book, really any book that promises it can summon demons as that is usually a big sign that it might be cursed. Catch in the rye? What the f Everyone's read this book. I'm not possessed. Maybe. And finally, in at number one, we have The Catcher in the Rye. The Catcher in the Rye is one of the most well known American books of the 20th century. It is often a required reading for most teens during high school. Despite this, the book has a dark past that often gets overlooked. It was written by J.D. Salinger and first published in 1951. The book is considered to perfectly capture the essence of adolescence. Throughout time and the changes in society, it is still relatable to teenagers' lives today. It reflects the true nature of being an adolescent, the rebellion, survival, and internal struggles of growing up. It follows the story of a young man named Holden Caulfield. He has been kicked out of a number of schools and when the story picks up, he has been kicked out of his latest school. He does not want to tell his parents fearing the punishment that might follow. He runs away from home and starts his adventures in New York. At the time of its release, it was seen as controversial for using bad language and adult themes, but the author didn't want to censor the book. He wanted an accurate depiction. None of this is why the book is considered cursed though. The curse comes from the link the book has to murders. The list of crimes linked to the book is longer than you might expect, one of the most famous being the assassination of John Lennon. His killer sat and read the book until the police arrived. He then used the book to write and sign his confession. He later explained that after reading the book he wanted to save Lennon and maintain his innocence forever. This is not the only famous murder connected to the book. Robert Bardo took the life of actress Rebecca Schaefer and John Hinckley assassinated Ronald Reagan. Both were carrying copies of the book while committing their crimes. It is unknown why this curse turns people into killers or how this book became cursed. It appears that it has the power to turn certain readers into criminals. It seems that it does not have the ability to make everyone behave in the same way. Maybe if you read the book at a low point in your life, you'll be susceptible to the curse. So there is a chance you'll read the book and be fine, but there is a risk that it will intercept your mind with the dark thoughts. It seems to make the reader believe they need to cleanse the world. So if you do have to read this, please just be careful. Coming in at number 5, we have Codex Gigas. The Codex Gigas is also known as the Devil's Bible. It was written in the 16th century by a monk. It has been told that the monk had broken his vow. He was then put on trial for breaking his vow. This is not something that was taken lightly. After a short trial, he was found guilty and sentenced to execution. He had a couple of days left. With the little time that he had left, he wanted to write everything he knew about the human experience. He wanted there to be something left of him after he passed on. He was writing as much as he could for as long as he could. He knew they would come to take him soon. With the little time that he had left, he decided that he would summon the devil. He wanted to make a deal with the devil. He promised him his soul if Lucifer would finish writing the book that he had started. Once he was taken away, the devil did just that. The book was completed by the devil himself. It is said to be overflowing in dark imagery. The book contains rituals that you can perform to contact the devil yourself. It also includes sketches of the devil and other demonic beings. The devil used the book to hold dark ancient curses. As an evil being, he wanted anyone who came into contact with the book in their life to be cursed. He wanted to take more souls as he did the old monk. It is said the soul of the monk is bound to the book by the devil as those who touch it may see or hear the monk's warning to save their souls. Coming in number 4 we have the Book of Soiger. The Book of Soiger is also known as the Book of Death. There have only ever been two copies known in existence. The book has been written in an unknown language. There has never been anyone who have been able to identify the language. It is also not known who has written the book. There was a lot of mystery around the text. A scholar named John Dee found the book. He wanted to attempt to decode the book. He became obsessed with the book. He started 
started to fall into insanity. John started to no longer resemble himself, his professional work was not the same, and he was consumed by the obsession of the writing. After his death in 1608, the book was lost. It was not discovered again until 1994. Since the book was resurfaced, many have tried to decode the book. Anyone attempting to decode the book have had to deal with some serious consequences. According to the legend, anyone who does successfully decode the book will pass away within the next three years. It's rumoured this may have been what happened to John Dee. Decoding the book might have driven him crazy and the curse took his life. He might have hidden the book so that for all those years it would not hurt anyone else or drive anyone insane. Both copies have now been found. They have been secured and can be found in London. One is kept at the British Library and the other is at the Bodleian Library. They are locked away safe so that no one can attempt to read the horrors contained within the text. Coming in at number 3 we have the Book of Abramelin. The book was formed from 12 manuscripts written by a man named Abraham. He wrote the book to pass on his secrets to his son. He told the story of his journey across the Egyptian desert. During his time in the desert he came across a magical being. The mage taught a powerful form of Kabbalistic magic to Abraham. In return the mage asked for Abraham to live in fear of the Lord and to serve him. He said he must not live his life in search of riches or have more than he needs. He warned him not to use the magic to obtain any of these things. When Abraham returned home he wrote the book to ensure he did not lose the knowledge. He wrote powerful incantations, ways to summon otherworldly beings as well as other powerful spells. His pride started to get the best of him once the book was complete. He decided to only keep this to himself and pass it down to his family. He began to boast of his newfound power. He bragged that he could raise the dead and become invisible at will. Of course no one in the town believed him. He decided he would show them all. He used minor spells to prove his power. Once they believed him others came to see him. They offered him great jewels to bring back their loved ones or bring them good fortune. He fell deeper and deeper into his greed. He had broken his oath to the mage. He began to have bad luck and strange things happening around him. He would see spirits from another world and was being haunted by dark entities. It is believed that as he broke his oath he became cursed. He suddenly passed away in a horrible accident. Since then anyone who owned the book was haunted and plagued by the curse. Abraham's family never used the book and tried to keep away from the rest of the world. Coming in at number 2 we have The King in Yellow. The King in Yellow is a book of short stories. It was written by writer Robert W. Chambers and first published in 1895. The book was named after a play which has the same name and recurs as a motive throughout some of the stories. The first half of the book contains highly esteemed horror stories. It has been described as a classic in the field of supernatural. There are 10 stories included in the book. The first four mention The King in Yellow. The King in Yellow is said to be a forbidden play that drives those who read it into despair and madness. Although these short stories only speak of the forbidden play, it is said that if you were to find the original text you may be driven mad. It was once performed for a mass audience. The cursed play lured the audience or reader in. By the time you get to the second act the audience or reader have been driven completely insane. This is why the text is thought to have been destroyed and is forbidden to read. If you do think you have found it then I warn you to not read it or you might just be driven mad yourself. I'm already mad so I can read it. And finally in at number 1 we have The Sorrows of Young Werther. The Sorrows of Young Werther is a novel written by John Wolfgang von Goethe and published in 1774. Goethe was 24 at the time of writing the book and it took him only 5 and a half weeks of intense writing to finish. It instantly placed him among the foremost international literary celebrities and was among the best known of his work. The majority of the plot focuses on a young man's extreme response to unrequited love. The book had a big cultural impact. It was given the name Werther Fever. Young men throughout Europe began to dress in clothing described in the novel. The obsession started to go a little further than this. Young men started to copy the ending of the book where the main character takes his own life. Copies of the book were found with each copycat passing. Authorities all over Europe were concerned and didn't know what to do. They banned the wearing of the clothing from the book hoping this would stop the copycats from taking inspiration from the text. It was labelled an epidemic and governments were desperate to stop the young men from passing. This led to a revision of the book in 1787. They gave the book a new ending, a happy ending in hopes of stopping any further pain. In the new ending a friend learns of his plans to hurt himself and stops him. The young man then learns how to become a part of society and goes on to live his life. The original copy of the book was banned. It is said if you read it even today you will be cursed and driven mad to the point of copying the steps of the young Werther. The new version of the book stopped the epidemic 
pandemic, and more books were given a happy ending to not cause such a disaster again. In at number five, we have The Orphan Story. The Orphan Story was published in 2018. However, the writing of this novel was started 400 years earlier by Martin de Leon Cardenas. Martin was not just any writer, he was a monk who broke his sacred vow. He wrote the majority of the novel between 1608 and 1615. There is a rumor of a curse surrounding the novel. The reason the book was not published until 2018 was due to everyone involved in the book mysteriously dying. The curse is rumored to have been attached to the book when the monk broke his sacred vow. He was the first to die before he could finish writing the story. It was Belinda Palacios who rediscovered the manuscript hidden in the archives of the Hispanic Society of America in 1965. She was determined to finish the book and have it published, but was deterred by her colleagues warning her about the curse. The book then went back into the archives. Others attempted to publish the book on several occasions. The publication fell through each time because those involved kept dying suddenly under mysterious circumstances. The deaths were caused by sudden traumatic events, horrific car accidents, sudden and unexplained illnesses. It finally took 400 years for someone to be brave enough to publish the book. Even now, after being published, it is believed the curse is still contained within the story. The difference being now, it has been duplicated and sent all over the world, making the curse stronger and having many more victims than it can claim. The origin of the curse contained in the book is unknown, however, it is thought to be millions of years old. Formed over the worship of ancient religions when the monk broke his vow, he unknowingly released the curse. It then latched onto the pages of the manuscript, taking anyone who dared to be involved with it. In at number four, we have Untitled Book of Spells. This untitled spell book was first known by the public in 2013. Two books were listed for sale online. The online seller was selling two mysterious handwritten and spiral bound spell books. The books were sold for a crazy $13,865. Once sold, the seller was sent a warning to the buyer saying, To those not of the craft, the reading of this book is forbidden. Proceed no further, or justice will exact a swift and terrible retribution, and you will surely suffer at the hand of the craft. The warning means that if you do not study witchcraft and you attempt to study or perform anything within the book, you will be cursed and will suffer. These spells were believed to have been written by a high priestess of Wiccan named Persephone Adrasta Irene sometime in the early 1960s. It is believed that she ran her own coven, keeping to herself in an area that others avoided. It is believed that spell books should always be burned after the witch who wrote them dies. The spells should not be used by anyone if not under the witch's supervision. The two books are believed to be reworkings of the original work by someone in the coven. They did not want the work to be lost, so they reworked and created two copies of the spells. This is not something that should ever be done. They each contain vast collections of incantations, curses, spells, and enchantments. There are instructions on how to summon spirits, demons, and otherworldly entities, as well as instructions on exorcism in case something goes wrong during another spell. It is not currently known where the book is or if the buyer is alive or dead. Hopefully, they are worthy to study the pieces, otherwise they may have cursed themselves. In at number 3 we have The Lesser Key of Solomon. The Lesser Key of Solomon is another book of spells. It is known as a cursed book of demonology. The author is unknown, as is usually the case with cursed books. Some say it is compiled from various texts gathering information from the most powerful spell books. It was first found in the 17th century. Since then the book has been published and can even be found on Amazon. But think before you purchase, the book contains passages on how you could conjure the dead, demons, or lost spirits. Once summoned, it also tells how you can use these spirits for your own bidding. Ancient texts are often rumored to be cursed. The same can be said for this one, with tragedy and bad luck following the book. This book, unlike the other spell books, includes unique spells that others don't often mention. For example, it includes how to make yourself invisible or locate missing items. There are recipes for love potions and even liquors of persuasion. It seems there is nothing that you could not achieve if you bought this book. This may be by design, promise those desperate for success or wanting something out of reach that they can have anything they want, all for a price of a book. You should get lots of sales. But this is definitely not a book that you should want to own. It is apparently so cursed that it will doom anyone who has it on their bookshelf. 
There have been claims of various hauntings surrounding the books. The pages of the book reportedly turn on their own if the book is left idle. Others noted the book flying across the room. There are also more concerning hauntings. People have heard demonic whisperings around the home after buying the book, while also seeing shadow creatures in the corner of their eyes. The good news is there is a way to break the curse if you have already welcomed it into your home. It has been claimed that the way to dispose of the book is to burn it to ashes. Once you dispose of the ashes, you should be free of the curse, unless of course you use one of the spells wrong and something has backfired. In at number 2 we have the Voynich Manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript is known to be one of the most mysterious books in the world. It is unknown who the author was or when it may have been written. It is 240 pages long, it is written cryptically in an indecipherable language. It is also full of strange elaborate illustrations. The book is one of a kind, it has attracted many great minds over the years, all driven crazy after not being able to crack the code. The book is named after Wilfred Voynich. He founded a second hand store in London. He was travelling in Rome during 1921 looking for books for his store. During his trip he discovered the manuscript. He gave the manuscript his name due to its mystery. He realised he had stumbled upon something very very special. The only indication of the books past was a letter found along with the book. The letter stated it was written in 1665. It spoke about how the manuscript had once belonged to the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, who reigned from 1576 to 1612, meaning it is at least 450 years old from what we know of. As most of the contents are unknown due to being unreadable, it is unclear exactly what the purpose of the book was. It is, however, believed that the book carries a curse of the old ones. This book may contain secrets of the ancient ones. This would explain why no one understands the language. It is an ancient dialect that no one alive today could comprehend. Some believe that if you did happen to crack the code, the curse would then be released. Even so, many have continued to try. Hopefully, no one ever does. If you spoke the words out loud, it might release an evil onto the world we could never stop. And finally, in at number one, we have the Necronomicon. The Necronomicon book is said to be bound in human flesh and inked in blood. It is a book of nightmares containing the darkest curses. Roughly translated, the title means an image of the law of the dead. It is said to even contain the power to resurrect the dead and summon ancient creatures. It is said that those who have read the book have turned insane or even died upon finishing the book. The story is that the book was written by Abdul Al Hazred and is over 1,000 pages long. Obviously, it is the most haunted, cursed, and doomed book in the world. It has even made appearances in various horror films including Evil Dead and Friday the 13th. Of course not a lot is known about the particular curses due to those who have read them no longer being around, but what we do know is that the original texts have the power to end humanity. If anyone was to survive the reading or survive performing one of the curses, they may summon one of the old ones. The old ones are the ancient creatures who ran the world before humanity, creatures like Cthulhu who if awakened would destroy the earth before we could even think about stopping it. People who have been tempted to bring back their past loved ones have turned to the Necronomicon for answers, only to be driven mad the further into the book they read. The book does contain the power to bring back loved ones, but you would have to survive losing your own mind and soul along the way. Most copies of the book were destroyed for obvious reasons, but not all of the contents are lost forever. If you're brave enough to read any of the dark curses inside, there is a copy located in Massachusetts Miskatonic University. Just be careful what you read into, it could be the last thing you ever do. In fifth place we have the Lesser Key of Solomon, also known as Lemagetan Clever. Vicula, Salomonis, or simply Lemegeton, this is probably the book on this list that I'm personally most familiar with. I've definitely referenced it more than once for y'all, since it has some great info on demons and their personalities. For simplicity's sake, I'll just refer to it as The Key today. The Key is an anonymously authored grimoire on demonology that was compiled in the mid 17th century, mostly from materials up to seven centuries older. It's divided into five books Ars Goetia, Ars Thurgia Goetia, Ars Paulina, Ars Almadel, and Ars Notoria. The Key is based on the Testament of Solomon and the ring mentioned within it that he uses to seal demons. While most of us know specifically the Ars Goetia for, you know, the 72 demons listed in the ranking, and I promise I'll get to the highlight reel in a moment. Now, while I don't have a technical definition for Ars, the Latin term Goetia refers to the evocation of demons or evil spirits, and is derived from an ancient Greek word meaning charm, witchcraft, or jugglery. In medieval and renaissance Europe, Goetia was generally considered evil and heretical, in contrast to Thurgia and Magia Naturalis, or natural magic, which were sometimes 
considered more noble. Okay, okay. The 72 demons I promised. I promise I won't bore y'all and list them all, but some notable ones include King Bael, Duke Valfor, King Baleth, Duke Barith, Duke Astaroth, King Asmodeus, King or Count Fine, and Samael. The Ars Thurgia Goetia mostly references Trithemius's Steganographia, though the seals and order of the spirits are different due to corrupted transmission via manuscript. Rituals not found in Stenographia were added, and in some ways conflicting with similar rituals found in the Ars Goetia and Ars Paulina. Most of the spirits summoned are tied to compass points. Four emperors are tied to the cardinal points of Carnesial in the east, Amenad Diel in the west, Demorial in the north, and Caspiel in the south. And six 16 dukes are tied to cardinal points, intercardinal points, and additional directions between those. There are in addition 11 wandering princes, so that a total of 31 spirit leaders each rule between several to a few dozen spirits. The Ars Paulina is derived from Book 3 of Trimethius' Stenographia and from portions of the Heptameron, but delivered by Paul the Apostle. Elements from the Magical Calendar, Astrological Seals by Robert Turner's 1656 translation of Periclesius' Archidoxies of Magic, and the year 1641 indicate that this portion was written in the later half of the 17th century. Traditions of Paul communicating with heavenly powers are almost as old as Christianity itself, as seen in some interpretations of Corinthians and the apocryphal Apocalypse of Paul. Now, the Ars Paulina is divided into two books, the first detailing 24 angels aligned with the 24 hours of the day, while the second detailing the 360 spirits of the degrees of the zodiac. The Ars Amadel instructs the magician on how to create a wax tablet with specific designs intended to contact angels via scrying. And finally, the Ars Notoria contains a series of prayers intended to grant eidetic memory and instantaneous learning to the magician. Pretty dang thorough. In fourth place, we have the Grand Grimoire. It's a black magic grimoire, and for reference, a grimoire is a textbook of magic that typically, you know, includes instructions on how to create magical objects like talismans and amulets, how to perform magical spells, charms, and divination, and how to summon or or invoke supernatural entities such as angels, spirits, deities, and demons. In many cases, the books themselves are believed to be imbued with magical powers, although in many cultures, other sacred texts that are not grimoires, you know, such as the Bible, have been believed to have supernatural properties intrinsically. Now, the only contents found in a grimoire would be information on spells, rituals, the preparation of magical tools, and lists of ingredients, and their magical correspondences. In this manner, while all books on magic could be thought of as grimoires, not all magical books should be thought of as grimoires. Different editions date the specific one to 1521, 1522, or 1421, but it was probably written during the early 19th century. Some experts suggest that 1702 is when the first edition may have been created, and a Bibliothèque Bleu version, similar to a chapter book, of the text may have been published in 1750. Now, the introductory chapter was authored by Antonia Veneciana del Rabina, who gathered his information from the original writings of King Solomon. Much of the material of this grimoire derives from the Key of Solomon and the Lesser Key of Solomon, which, you know, our grimoire is attributed to King Solomon. Also known as Le Dragon Rouge, or the Red Dragon, this book contains instructions on how to summon Lucifer, or Lucifer Rofocal, for the purpose of forming a deal with the devil. The 19th century French occultist Eliphas Lévy, author of Dogme et Rituel de la Haute Magie, claimed the contemporary edition of Le Dragon Rouge was a counterfeit of a true older grand grimoire. Gosh, I love petty historical spats. Now, the overall work is divided into two books. The first book contains instructions for summoning a demon and for the construction of tools with which to force a demon to do one's bidding. The second book is divided further into two more parts. The Sanctum Regnum and Secrets, De l'Or Magique du Grand Grimoire. The Sanctum Regnum contains instructions for making a pact with the demon, allowing one to command the spirit without the tools required by Book 1, but at greater risk. Secrets contains simple spells and rituals one can employ after having performed the ritual of the first book. Some editions contain a short text between these two parts, known as Le Secret Magique ou Le Grand Art de Pouvoir Parler aux Morts, or in English, The Magic Secret or the Grand Art of Being Able to Speak with the Dead, which deals with necromancy. The book describes several demons as well as the rituals to summon them in order to make a pact with them. It also details several spells for winning a lottery, talking to spirits, being loved by a girl, making oneself invisible, and more. This book mentions the three greater demons, which are similarly prioritized in the Grimorium Verum. Sidebar, in the English translation of the work, the demons are referred to by the more generic term of spirits, which is a term I know some modern Satanists tend to prefer. The demons that are mentioned are the Emperor Lucifer, Prince Beelzebub, and Grand Duke Astaroth. Now, this work also makes mention of six lesser demons, and of course I'll mention them all. Lucifer Rufokal, Prime Minister, Satan Nachia, Commander-in-Chief, Agliarept, Commandant, 
Flaherty, Lieutenant General, Sargatanaz, Brigadier Major, Nebiros, Marshal, and Inspector General. In third place, we have the Complete Book of Demonolatry. Written by S. Connolly, it boasts telling the reader how to discover powerful rites, magic, and practices that honor Satan and the demons. Now, this text, used by the traditional demonolatry priesthood to train members of their covens, is part workbook, part textbook, and part reference book. It includes thorough chapters on demonology, history, demonic holy days, offerings, prayers, sigils, religious rites, and an introduction to demonolatry magic. Okay, this might be the first book I'm actually tempted to buy for myself. If only just to learn more about like demonology history from someone that isn't Ed Warren for once. I love the Warrens and their work, but at the same time, it would be kind of neat to learn from a lens that isn't, you know, as biased in Catholicism. Let's see what else it advertises. Learn how and why the ends, demonolatry sigils, ascension, and many other demonolatry methods have become standard practice among many theistic Satanists. It claims to guide students from pre-initiate to adept. It even delves into the depths of demonolatry, sex magic, necromancy, scarlet elixir rites, and red fluid sacrifice. See, that entire last phrase I can do without. Let me know what y'all think in the comments. Should I bother investing in it or not? In second place, we have the Grimorium Verum. The Grimorium Verum, which is Latin for true grimoire, is an 18th century grimoire attributed to one Alabac the Egyptian of Memphis, who wrote it in 1517. Like many grimoires, yep, it claims a tradition originating with King Solomon. The grimoire is not a translation of an earlier work, with its original appearing in French or Italian in the mid 18th century, as noted already by A.E. Waite, who discussed the work in his book of ceremonial magic in 1911, stating that the date specified in the title of Grimorium Verum is undeniably fraudulent since the work belongs to the middle of the 18th century and Memphis is Rome. Alrighty. One version of the grimoire was included as the Clavicles of King Solomon, Book 3, in one of the French manuscripts S. L. McGregor Mathers incorporated in his version of the Key of Solomon, but it was omitted from the key with his explanation. That apparently at the end there are some short extracts from the Grimorium Verum with the seals of evil spirits, which, as they do not belong to the Key of Solomon proper, I have not given. For the evident classification of the key as in two books and no more. I just love feuds. Andrew Shaw also published some of it in The Secret Lore of Magic, the Book of Sorcerers in 1957. Alrighty, time to break down all four books. So book one is described as concerning the character of demons, particularly the superior spirits of Lucifer, Beelzebub, Astaroth, while also including the many inferior spirits below them and their invoking sigils. Who wants to hear about what all the lesser spirits can do? Klonek has the power to bring money to those who make a pact with him. Lucissin has power over important people and politicians. Frymost has power over women. Klepoth can help you experience all sorts of dreams and visions. Kill can manifest dramatic situations and changes. Mercilde has dominion over long and short distance travel. Clisthird can create confusion or enlightenment, depending on what you need. Searchade can make you see all sorts of natural and supernatural creatures. Pickpacks can make a person think of you, no matter how far or distant they may be. Humans can bring you any book you desire. Seagal will cause all sorts of prodigies to appear. Brucissier can teach you the art of necromancy. Guland causes all illnesses. Serga can create every kind of opportunity for advancement. Moriel can help you move about unseen. Frutimier prepares all kinds of feasts for you. Puggy Tigras, I tried cause a sleep in the case of some and insomnia in others. Tempting. I could use a good night's sleep. Book two is simply described as being of planetary hours, so I'll leave that up to y'all to interpret what you think it means. Book three is the preparation of the operator, or more simply put, how to prepare for summoning. A more modern title could be, you know, Demon Summoning for Dummies, or How to Summon a Demon 101. Just saying. Book four contains the Sanctum Regnum, called the Royalty of Spirits, or the Little Key of Solomon, a most learned Hebraic necromancer and rabbi. Gee, where have I referenced that before? This book contains various combinations of characters where the powers can be invoked or brought forth whensoever you may wish, each according to his faculty. Long story short, it's a very descriptive and thorough demon summoning bible, if you will. Once again, I personally do not recommend summoning demons, but if you really feel like you must, this feels like it would produce safer outcomes than, say, a random YouTube ritual or Ouija board. Okay, anything's better than a cursed board, but this one I feel like I can kind of endorse and still sleep at night, you know? In first place, we have the Munich Manual of Demonic Magic, the MMDM, or Libel Incantionum, Exorcism Memorium, et Fascinatorium Variarium, is a 15th century grimoire manuscript. The text, composed in Latin, is largely concerned with demonology and necromancy. Richard Kiekefer edited the text of the manuscript in 1998 under the title Forbidden Rites, a necromancer's manual of the 15th century. Portions of the text in English translation are presented 
in Forbidden Rites as well, embedded within the author's essays and explanations on the Munich Manual and specific and grimoires in general. The Russian translation of this Latin grimoire was published in 2019, while the first English transition was published in only 2023. There is only one known surviving manuscript of the original Munich Manual, which is almost complete, except for the first two folios that describe the beginning of the first ritual. The rest of the grimoire contains complete instructions for the invocation of demons, such as Satan, Lilith, Astaroth, and Semael, as well as the supposed attainment of favors and supernatural powers from them. Some of the spells allow for obtaining the love of a woman, achieving invisibility, acquiring wealth and treasures, or gaining knowledge. The text is accompanied by over 40 illustrations of magic circles and symbols to be used in the ritual. Pages 130 to 133 of the text include a list of 11 demons, similar to the one from the Ars Goetia. Since there are only 11, I suppose I could list them all off. Count slash Duke Barbarus, Duke Casson, President slash Count Odius, King Curson, Duke Alugor, Prince Teob, President Fulak, Duke Ganeron, Marquis Tuveris, and President Hani. Oh, and Marquis Sukax. I promise I did my best with pronunciations. Most of the text is in Latin, with the exception of two appended materials in German and Italian. Makes sense to me. Anyone feel like learning a dead language? Coming in at number five, the Voynich Manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript is arguably the most infamous on our list, to say the least. To begin, the book is written in an unknown writing system that many to this day are still attempting to decipher. It is unknown who wrote the book, but it is named after after Wilfred Voynich, a Polish book dealer who purchased it in 1912. The mystery of the book has excited people over the years, but we're still no closer to figuring out its contents or origins. Many have speculated that the book itself may be evil, and judging by the pictures included, may contain spells or incantations for summoning demons. But this is all speculation. There have been many people over the years who have claimed to have deciphered the text, from Robert S. Brumbaugh, who claimed that the manuscript was a forgery intended to fool Emperor Rudolf II into purchasing purchasing it, or Stephen Bax who claimed that the manuscript was about nature, or even Nicholas Gibbs who claimed it was a guide to women's health. We may never know what knowledge the book holds, perhaps at the end of the day it's a hoax, but some speculate it may be something evil that we should never attempt to uncover. In it for the sworn book of Honorius. This is a medieval grimoire written by Honorius of Thebes. It is the oldest existing medieval grimoire and arguably the most influential. The text contains incantations and invocations to induce visions from heaven, hell and and purgatory. It is also widely believed that the person who is capable of deciphering all the texts will gain the access to all the knowledge in the world. Not too shabby. Now its history is hazy, but the book is supposedly the product of a group of magicians who condensed all their knowledge into one book. Many of its instructions include how to conjure and command a demon, how to work other magical operations, as well as the knowledge of what lies in heaven, among other things. It has been classified as a Solomonic grimoire due to its heavy angelic powers, like those found in the key of Solomon. In at 3, The Satanic Bible. Published in 1969 and written by Anton LaVey, The Satanic Bible is a collection of essays, observations, and rituals, and is the central text of Satanism, and it's also considered to be the foundation of its philosophy. The Bible is divided into four sections, the Book of Satan, the Book of Lucifer, the Book of Belial, and the Book of Leviathan, the latter offering invocations for sex, compassion, and destruction, as well as invocation of Satan. Thankfully, the Satanic Bible is not considered to be a sacred scripture, like the Christian Bible is to Christians, but Satanists do regard it as authoritative text. The Satanic Bible has been condemned by many for being dangerous, particularly to adolescents. As problematic as this book is, it is still available in most places, although many schools have made an attempt to ban the text. Few have been successful though. Coming in at number 2, The Necromancer's Manual. Also known as the Munich Manual of Demonic Magic, this book is a 15th century grimoire manual Manuscript. This text is seen as a guidebook to evoke demonic entities. The book includes a variety of spells and rituals divided into three themes, illusionist, psychological, and divinatory. Not only that, but it was believed that this book was the tool to control people, time, and emotions. Yeah. There is no real way of knowing that someone isn't out there right now using this book to control you. Think about it. And finally, coming in at number one, The Grand Grimoire. To put it simply, this book teaches you how to summon and control demons. Yep. Is there anything worse than that? No. 
The answer is no. Also known as the Red Dragon, this book was written in the early 19th century, with its publication date ranging from 1521 to 1522 or even 1421. It was authored by Antonio del Rabina, I hope I said that right, who had supposedly gathered his information from the original writings of King Solomon. The book contains instructions to summon Lucifer for the purpose of forming a deal with the devil. The Grand Grimory is divided into two books, the first half containing the instructions for summoning a demon, and the second half divided into two further parts, The Sanctum Regnum and Secrets of the Magic Art of Grand Grimory. The former contains instructions for making a pact with the demon, allowing you to command it without the tools required in Book 1. The latter contains simple spells and rituals you can perform in order to complete the summoning and the controlling. All in all, it's not a book that should be placed in the hands of the morally ambiguous, let's just say that. Kicking off at number 5. Mrs. Coulter. And if you haven't read Philip Pullman's fantastic series, His Dark Materials, I highly suggest that you do. But in a tale that literally pits the eternal forces of evil against the eternal forces of good, the terrifying Mrs. Coulter remains to be one of the most violent, selfish, and memorable villains of recent times. And although Nicole Kidman's performance in the widely disappointing 2007 movie was actually incredibly fitting for her character, I'm talking purely about the novels in this particular instance. Because, yeah, the less said about that movie, the better, really. And it's an interesting one because if you know nothing about the novels, Pullman's His Dark Materials is a young adult trilogy that covers some incredibly weighty themes, but it's in the later implication of Mrs. Coulter's actions where the true consequences of her villainy were finally revealed. Although that's definitely not to say that throughout the story she's not the literal definition of evil wrapped up in an aesthetically pleasing package because that's exactly what she is. Now I'll try my hardest not to spoil the character of Mrs. Coulter, but perhaps the best way to describe the nature of her evil is with her demon. You see, in the world of His Dark Materials, people are explicitly connected to a creature that serves as a physical manifestation of their human soul, which appears as various kinds of creatures from the animal kingdom. In this instance, Mrs. Coulter's demon was a male golden monkey that on the surface appeared to be a beautiful, curious creature, and alongside his human familiar, the two of them would entice and flatter adults and children alike whilst working for the General Ablation Board, the secret arm of the Magisterium, a corrupt holy church. Like I said, waiting. Her demon perfectly reflected Mrs. Coulter's personality as a beautiful creature on the surface, but running deep with malevolent intentions. On one occasion, her demon was seen tearing the wings off of cave bats out of sheer boredom. Yeah, that says a lot. Coming in at number 4, O'Brien. And this particular fictional creation comes from George Orwell's resounding and highly important novel, 1984. And yeah, it's going to be incredibly difficult to explain the evil behind this character in particular without spoiling the novel. But hey, Orwell published this book 70 years ago in 1949, so I think you've had fair warning. In the world of 1984, the protagonist, Winston Smith, lives in a dystopian, oppressive, totalitarian version of Britain, a portion of the super state of Oceania, which has been been under the rule of Ingsoc and Big Brother for time long forgotten. He who controls the past controls the future and all that. In the society, nothing is safe from the eternal gaze of Big Brother, and even the confines of the human mind aren't safe from the Thought Police, an organisation that serves as the secret, ever watchful eye of Ingsoc. And that's where O'Brien steps in, an administrator that works in the Ministry of Truth, and who leads Winston Smith to believe that he is secretly leading an underground resistance known as the Brotherhood, to bring down Ingsoc from within and overthrow the party. In actual fact though, as is revealed in a vile moment of realisation in the novel, this whole thing is just a game to O'Brien. And he, in fact, finds great joy weeding out citizens that aren't completely loyal to the party and to Ingsoc. O'Brien's entire method of operation is to lure in anyone who even questions the party's authority by pretending to be on their side and buy into their model of rebellion, and then, of course, instead arrest them and cure them through moments of perverse torture of the human mind. I mean, compared to some entries on this list, O'Brien is the definition of a very human fear. He exemplifies totalitarian authority with every morsel of hope that he extinguishes. In his own words, if you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. Yeah, although perhaps not the root of all villainy, this guy comes pretty close. Next up at number 3, Euron Greyjoy. And please, no, don't panic, I'm not talking about the show's representation of Euron Greyjoy, but purely the book series. Although I still love the show for the most part, Euron Greyjoy wasn't given the portrayal that his character deserved, and there's no denying that in George Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire, the crow's eye himself, Euron Greyjoy, is one of the most terrifying villains in the whole of modern fantasy. And again, it's because of his humanity, or lack thereof. Now George Martin is one of the finest writers of our time and has a particular knack for creating characters of pure evil, down to the fact that he segues the conventional notions of light and dark and instead focuses on areas of grey. But no, 
Not for Euron. Euron Greyjoy is just straight up the most truly evil inhabitant of the known world. Just compare him to some of the most memorable villains of the entire series so far, anyway, and they all pale in comparison to Euron. Ramsay Bolton, Tywin Lannister, Joffrey, all of them various shades of villainy, cruelty, and malice that have all equally committed some of the most violent and horrifying atrocities in the series. And Euron still takes the cake. You see, he's not a psychopath in the conventional sense, he's not prone to violent bursts of anger by impulse alone, but maintains his own entirely calculated sense of chaos that once showing us the true rage that lies within him. And believe me, there's plenty of it. Take for example how Euron Greyjoy calmly ripped out the tongues of his entire crew after a storm took his ship by surprise. He ripped out every single crew member's tongue without a second thought and his reason was that he needed silence. Allegedly, anyway. Because as we all know it's pretty difficult to stage a mutiny without a tongue. And that isn't even close to the worst of it because the true evil of Euron's character is explicitly revealed throughout allusions to his childhood, pitting reason as to why his brothers despise him with such hatred. You see the Greyjoys are pirates, reavers and pillagers who take what they want in pursuit of riches untold. But Euron, despite having sailed pretty much across the entire known world, collecting countless treasures treasures along the way and becoming the most successful Iron Islander of all time, he keeps none of it for himself. Euron isn't in it for the plunder, perhaps then his violent nature would make sense, he's in it for something else entirely. What that something is, only he'll ever know, and that's the terrifying part. Swinging in at number 2. Nurse Ratched. And this particular entry may get people's blood boiling a little because there's no denying the fact that Louise Fletcher's performance in 1975's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest caused an entire generation to scream out in rage at the screen as her fantastic portrayal of Nurse Ratched relentlessly proved that there are few limits to the depths that absolute power can corrupt absolutely. And although Fletcher's performance was without a doubt iconic in its own right, that's not to detract from the fact that Ken Kesey's 1962 novel just so happened to pen one of the most terrifying villains in the whole of of literature. And again, it was down to her warped sense of humanity, or lack thereof, where the true nature of evil was found. However, the tragedy of Ratchet's character only serves to make us as an audience question our own sense of morality, and ultimately it forces us to confront whether we can or should ever forgive evil. I'll try my utmost not to spoil anything behind this tale in particular, but as the novel explains, Nurse Ratchet is the head administrative nurse at Salem State Hospital, a mental institution where the novel's narrator, Chief Brodom, resides alongside the iconic Randall McMurphy and a whole host of other patients that make up the fabric of Kesey's tragic tale. At Salem State, Nurse Ratchet exercises her absolute power over the patients, using her patients' access to medication and basic necessities as a means to malevolently maintain a corrupt, cruel, authoritarian regime over some of the most vulnerable members of our society. I mean, revealing the true nature of Nurse Ratchet's pure propensity for evil would be spoilers enough, but holy moly, believe me when I say this character is a creation of true, true evil. Whether we can understand her motivations is a different question entirely, but Nurse Ratchet remains to be one of the most perverse demonstrations of authority and the evil that so often comes with it. Yeah, she definitely deserves a place on this list. And finally coming in at our number one spot, Hannibal Lecter. And that should be Dr. Hannibal Lecter because I'm not in the mood to piss off one of the most complex and dangerous minds in the entirety of fiction. Some would argue that in fact Hannibal Lecter is the most perfect villain ever created and that's without being in many cases the actual villain of his story. Created by Thomas Harrison first appearing in his 1981 novel Red Dragon, Hannibal Lecter is a forensic psychiatrist on one side and a cannibalistic serial killer on the other. Throughout the events of Red Dragon, the novel's protagonist Will Graham comes to the stark understanding that Dr. Lecter doesn't fit any conventional psychological profile. In fact, psychiatrists refer to him as a sociopath simply because they don't know what else to call him. A fact which is reinforced in the later novels where Clarice Starling states that they don't have a name for what he is. In many ways though, Hannibal Lecter is the antithesis of what a human should be. He operates more as a machine than he does a man, demonstrated through his unrivaled intelligence and his eidetic memory where he often explains the details of his elaborate memory palace and narrative function that is often paired to a similar brilliant mind, Sherlock Holmes. That makes you think, right? However, despite his superior intellect, it comes with the extent and variability of his actions where the fear truly lies. Much like Euron Greyjoy, Hannibal Lecter is a pool of such depth and complexity that the understanding of his motivations would, or will, perhaps never be reached by the rest of humanity. And that's where the true brilliance of Harris's creation truly shines, because as portrayed in the novels and the later films with the legendary performance of Sir Anthony Hopkins, we as an audience find Lecter to be a likeable character. He's a cannibal, he eats people with fava beans and a nice Chianti, and yet we can't help but finding ourselves 
liking this guy. He's more akin to the likes of Frankenstein's monster or Dracula. He's a creation of horror that can only serve to go along with their nature and strangely enough for a human looking in that fact forms a bizarre thread of curiosity that draws us in. Hannibal Lecter is the definition of horror. Equal parts fear, equal parts curiosity and he's a mystery that we'll never truly understand.